There's something in there. Hold up the light, man, it's a box. What is this thing? In the small town of Edenton in North Carolina, some community members had gathered together to renovate and rebuild an old house of worship. The building had been abandoned for years, and it was after long that the townsfolk took the initiative to get the building repaired, up and running. However, demolition of the ruins were halted when the local workers discovered an old box kept inside one of the walls of the house. It was chained and locked, but it had become so old and rusted that it broke apart with a few strikes. The workers were surprised to find a few pieces of paper that had been preserved inside, and on them were some writings. None of them were able to read it, and hence took the discovery to higher authorities, assuming it must be something important since they found it on what was once sacred grounds. Eventually, the strange discovery made its way to a research institution in Edenton, where it was handed to archaeologist Jean Irvine. When Jean caught sight of the material, she was sure she was looking at something that could contain a lot of historical information. It was an opportunity to uncover more knowledge. However, she was bewildered herself by the ancient language. She had never seen anything like it. The symbols in which the texts were written were not similar to any other existing language. Linguist Gregory Rhodes was assigned onto the team to decipher this piece of writing. I'm confused myself. This text doesn't match any other language. It's as if this was scrawled with inscrutable, incomprehensible glyphs. As you know, it was found in an abandoned building on the outskirts of town. The locals here say it was a place of worship at one point. I've researched many other similar findings from the surrounding area. Why don't you take a look at them? Look, there is a slight resemblance to some of these archaic letters and occult symbols used in all these other sources. No, Jean. This is nothing like these texts. This is an absolutely new language, most likely created by someone who had knowledge of both ancient and modern languages. It's a code. The carbon dating results came in. This material dated back to the 1800s. That's nearly 200 years ago. Someone who had the knowledge of ancient languages was rare, and modern languages? How could that be possible? And considering the person had hidden it with enough precaution that it lasted to this date, we must be onto something big. Hmm. I suppose I know someone who can help us. He's a friend of mine. He's a computer scientist at the BII University. He's been working on a decoding software. Though it's still in the process of making, I'm not sure if it will work, but there's no harm in giving it a try. Upon request, Roger Sullivan, a computer scientist, agreed to help out on the research work after he himself heard of the strange story behind this bizarre discovery. He arrived at the Edenton Institution a few days later, where the three colleagues sat down and got to work. Roger loaded the information onto the software. This might take all night. I'm in doubt if this will work. I've never worked with material like this before. When you told me about the discovery, I was quite intrigued. In these past days, I looked into the matter myself, and I found something that totally got me sitting on the edge of my seat. What? Irvine, have you looked into the site itself, where these papers were found? According to my research, this box was brought from a different house of worship. From Sicily, Italy, to America. The building in Edenton was constructed a long time back. It was an old house of worship, however, According to historical accounts, this house of worship had been broken down by people some time after the shipment. But why? Are you saying this could be some sort of time capsule, diary or message from one of the members? I can't say, but there has to be something about it, to break down a house of worship and the townsfolk wouldn't protest? Well, I dived into what the locals knew about the place. I learned there was some sort of disagreement among the members. What sort of disagreement? There's a legend that goes around here. A portion of this house of worship was used 
as a convent where a group of sisters in faith resided. Of the sisters, there was one woman, Sister Genevieve, who had come into the notice of the other sisters. She often spent time alone by the altar in the main place of worship, in front of the building, and was sometimes found speaking all on her own in her room. The other sisters suspected her of doing something she wasn't supposed to do. She was hiding something. What? No, you're all misunderstanding me. I was praying to the Lord. I beg him to save us from all evil. Lying will only put you and us into more trouble. You're ruining yourself, sister. No, believe me, I'm not lying. Then where do you go in the middle of the night? You think we don't hear your murmurs? You've been meeting someone. You'll not be able to find any proof of me being indecent. I can't do such a thing. Our faces will be blackened if people know what you've been up to. No, sisters, believe me. I've been feeling like something terrible is to occur. I only go to pray to the Lord to save us. The sisters didn't believe her and complained to the abbess who looked into the matter, finding the allegations to be unexpectedly true. Sister Genevieve was expelled out of the convent and confined to a cell, where she would remain in punishment for her misconduct. <coughs> While she was there, strange things began to happen at the confinement center. The security guards were frightened to hear piercing screams from Sister Genevieve's cell. In the middle of the night, the woman would scream at the top of her lungs as if she were being attacked. But when authorities went to inspect the matter, they couldn't find a reason to the woman's fear, except for her own bizarre claims. Please, please, I must go to the altar. I must plead to the Lord or an evil power will overtake me. You're not getting out of here. No, please, you don't understand. I don't want to die like this. I've lived a life of righteousness. Keep your lies to yourself. You're not pious. You're under sin. Authorities assumed that all that the woman had been doing was an act to get herself out of confinement. They believed the woman was sinful. She had to be punished, and through her, they would set an example so no one would dare commit the wrong she had. They kept her locked up, and didn't pay heed to her words. However, over the days, her condition continued to worsen to the point where the authorities themselves became skeptic if this was an act, or if the woman was truly in pain. They began to find the woman fallen to the ground from her bed, her wrists and ankles twisted and dislocated. They attempted to help her, but she was irresponsive to anything they asked her and continued speaking things that made no sense. She's possessed. There is no resisting the forces of evil. This is the consequence of all the wrong she has committed. Look what sin has done to her. There is no resisting the forces of evil. There is no resisting the forces of evil. There is no resisting the forces of evil. Authorities soon began to find the woman with strange cuts, bruises, and marks over her body, some in places where she could not have done to herself. When these strange incidents continued, they called the high priest to come see the woman. It has taken power over her. She is possessed. She must be cleansed before this evil overtakes her soul. The touch of the fire. The fire. I must soon go, or he will take me to him. No. No, I don't want to go. But he will give me all I want. No, his promise is false. The high priest tried everything he could in an attempt to cure the woman, but nothing helped her. These unusual occurrences continued. The woman shrieked and yelled odd things. The woman shrieked. Until one day, Genevieve was found unconscious in her cell. On the ground was spilled a container of ink that had stained all her clothing. A quill was still in her hand, and this letter was found scrawled on. No one could decipher its meaning. 
The Dark Lord has written it through me. This is a message from the Dark Lord. When the woman regained consciousness, she continued to scream and claimed absurd things. Those letters were sent to the elders of the House of Worship to get some insight as to what the woman could be trying to communicate. But before anyone could reach any conclusion, the following morning, Sister Genevieve was found lifeless in her cell. No one knew how she passed away. All that remained of her was this letter she left behind. This is quite strange indeed. If Sister Genevieve passed away, then who hid these letters inside the building? One of the other members? There's no way we can confirm these legends. Over time, the original story is bound to change. Perhaps so, but it is true that one of the sisters was expelled from the convent there, passed away in confinement, and it's most likely that the house of worship was broken down after that. Even if the legend is true, today we have better understanding on mental health. It could just be that the woman was suffering from schizophrenia, which led her to behave like that. Without the proper treatment, she must have suffered a brain stroke, a heart attack from fear. It could be anything. Yeah, but one thing still doesn't make sense. How could she write something that requires her to have extensive knowledge of linguistics? Schools in that time didn't teach such. No one even possessed the knowledge to teach it in the first place. Hmm, this is all quite strange. It was around 6 in the morning. The team had fallen asleep on their desks, looking through numerous reports and evidence, trying to link one incident to the other. Roger rushed to his computer to find the text had been successfully decoded. Rhodes! Arvine! It worked! It worked! Jean and Gregory hurried to read the code. But what they discovered sent chills down their spine. The Dark Lord will soon come to power. The day is near when mankind shall serve him. The day mankind will bow to him as slaves. The Dark Lord will rise above all. No one shall escape his power. And the first of all signs shall be knowledge of this message. What have you done? Dad, let me out. Dad, please, let me out. Just this morning, Susan Koenig noticed a couple had moved into the house next door. They were both young, probably in their early 30s. The man had been unloading his van while his wife was sitting out watching him. The woman was disabled, in a wheelchair. They looked like decent people and Susan thought she'd drop by later that afternoon and welcome them to the neighborhood and introduce herself. On just the first day of moving into this cozy home in the suburbs of Burlington in Shelburne, Vermont, Marshall and Bethany Clemens were surprised to have a visitor over. A woman, slightly older than them, carrying a basket of cookies and a smile on her face, stood at their porch. Good afternoon. My name is Susan Koenig. I live next door, and I saw you moved in this morning. I hope you guys weren't busy. I brought a small gift. Susan said, handing over the basket. No, no, absolutely not. Thank you. That's very kind of you. I'm Marshall Clemens. My wife, Bethany, and I moved here together. Would you like to come in? Who is it, Marshall? Bethany said, coming to the door. It's our neighbor. Hello, I'm Susan. It's nice to meet you. Marshall and I were just talking about getting to know people around here. We were actually thinking of hosting a small housewarming party this Friday evening. Please do come with your family. Oh, that sounds nice. I'll try to make it. Take care. 
Susan found the couple quite respectful and kind, and the next Friday, she and her husband John arrived at the Clemens house. We're so glad you came. We don't really know a lot of people around here. Oh, that's not a problem at all. Won't you go to the weekend preachings at the house of worship? It's a perfect opportunity to meet all the neighbors around here. Marshall and Bethany awkwardly looked at each other. We actually aren't involved with any house of worship, Marshall said. And instantly, he could see Susan and John's face suddenly darken. It seemed that these people were quite religious. Sensing the discomfort, Bethany quickly passed on the dish. It's not that we don't believe, it's just that we're not so focused on this aspect of our lives. Please, enjoy your meals. Yes, yes of course. John and I have actually been part of this house of worship for many years now. Much of the people in this neighborhood are associated with it. The rest of the dinner that night went by awfully quiet and awkward. Though Marshall and Bethany had been very hospitable and kind, Susan and John didn't really like knowing that they were perhaps skeptics of the faith. The Clemens, they moved in next door to you, haven't they? I thought I would introduce myself today, but I haven't spotted them. They aren't coming. They invited us to their house the other day. We got talking and we found out they're more of a secular people. They don't believe? Have you preached the word of the Lord to them? John and I thought it best to remain cordial. Well, the choice is upon them, but we must call people to the faith. Faith healer Lewis Reed is coming to this town next June. There'll be a seminar. Ask them to come. It'll be a good experience for them. Lewis Reed was a very famous faith healer who had traveled all around the U.S. sharing the knowledge of the Lord and bringing people into the faith. After a grand seminar held at Burlington, he was traveling through the suburbs before he would go to his next destination. So, the next time Susan met with Marshall and Bethany, she politely asked them to come. I know you're not involved with the house of worship and that's absolutely fine, but there'll be a seminar this Sunday and a very famous preacher will be there. His name is Lewis Reed. He's a very good man and he always has good things to say. It'll be nice of you to be there. We don't know. Please, it's a request from myself. It will only be an hour long. On Susan's insistence, Marshall and Bethany felt a bit pressurized to go. John had offered to drive them all that Sunday morning. And for the most part, much of the seminar went quite well. Lewis Graham had shared some good words, but it was towards the end that he suddenly called out to the crowd. Now let us join our faiths together and call upon the Lord to show us a miracle today. A miracle, ladies and gentlemen. He walked off the stage and into the crowd and suddenly stopped at Bethany. What is your name, ma'am? Bethany Clemens, she said nervously. Will you please come with me? As Bethany looked at her husband, Susan and a few other folk encouraged her to go. She followed the preacher to the stage where he began asking her a few more questions. How did this happen to you? Some accident, perhaps? Yes, I got into an accident almost 10 years ago. My lower body became paralyzed. I haven't walked since. Now, ladies and gentlemen, 10 years is too long to be in a wheelchair, isn't it? For a young, strong woman like her, let us pray to the Lord to bless this woman. Bethany stared at the preacher as he raised his hands in front of her and began chanting, Lord, we ask you to give this woman strength. Heal this woman with your power. He looked at her. Try to get up. I can't. You can. You just have to believe. Lord, give strength and life to these legs. Bethany put her feet down to the ground and pushed herself up and suddenly began to walk. The crowd all started to gasp and cheer as Bethany cried out tears of joy. It's a miracle! It's a miracle! People said Lewis Reed was a man blessed by the Lord with holy powers. He had healed many people before through these miracles, 
and wherever he went, believing folk rushed to attend his seminars for this very reason. Lewis often shared his journey of faith with his followers. It all began many years ago, when he himself had fallen ill. He had been bedridden with the disease the doctor said would be fatal. It was at a time like this that Lewis called out to the heavens, and on a night, when he felt as if his soul would depart, he saw a light, an angel that had not come to take him, but to bestow him with many more years to live. And Lewis chose to spend those years preaching the word of the Lord, and it had been since then that he realized he had not only been blessed with life, but with the power to heal. That day after the seminar, while Lewis Reed was packing up with his crew backstage, a man from the audience came to meet him. Hello, I'm Franklin Wells. I own a farming business here in Shelburne. It's quite well known in town. Yes, I know of you. You've generously donated to our foundation. May the Lord bless you with more success, Lewis said with a smile. I've actually come here with a request to you. My daughter Elisa has been sick for a long time now. Would you please come to visit her? What has happened to your daughter? I cannot explain to you, sir. As a matter of fact, neither have the doctors. But after seeing the miracle the Lord has performed through you today, perhaps only you can help my daughter. All right, I'll come with you. It was late that afternoon, Mr. Wells offered to take Lewis himself to the farm, where was the Grand Wells Estate. After a small drive, they reached the mansion where Mr. Wells escorted Lewis inside. My daughter is in her room. She cannot come out here. You'll have to come with me. Yes, yes, of course. Whatever is convenient for her. I don't want to trouble a soul. She must be suffering from a lot already. Lewis followed after Mr. Wells down the grand halls of the mansion to a room that had been locked. Quite curious, he watched as Mr. Wells unlocked the dark room and turned on the lights. Elisa, dear, there's someone here to meet you. Mr. Wells ushered his daughter to come forth. As Lewis watched the young girl resist, staying seated on the bed. It's all right, don't pressure the child. Lewis looked at the young woman staring at the ground. Can you look at me, Elisa? But when the young woman didn't shift, Lewis stretched out his hand towards her. When all of a sudden, Luisa looked up, furious. She began to breathe heavily. As Lewis pulled back his hand, he was bewildered to see Elisa's eyes develop a reddish hue. Her veins pulsate across her neck. Get, Get away, away from, from me, me, said a deep, coarse voice that couldn't belong to that of a young woman like she. It was nearly two years ago that Elisa Wells, the only child of the richest man in Shelburne, Franklin Wells, had suddenly fallen ill. She had become uncontrollable, savage, a harm to herself and to others around her, and had to be locked up in this room, within the walls of the mansion. Mr. Wells was devastated seeing his daughter's condition. She had never been like this. She was a beautiful, mannerly young woman. He couldn't understand how this could happen. He brought in doctors to examine her, who all told him his daughter had gone mad. But Mr. Wells wasn't prepared to believe so. There had to be something more to this. And it was when he began to look into the matter that he spoke to one of Elisa's close friends. Mr. Wells, the last time I actually spoke to Elisa, she told me she had bunked school and gone to a broken old house of worship near our school. It was one morning that Elisa had met up with her boyfriend Andrew, and the two had decided to bunk school and spend the day together. Wanting some privacy, the young couple ended up going to an abandoned house of worship. However, when they went inside, they found out they weren't quite alone. A homeless man had been using the broken house as a shelter, and seeing the young couple, he had disapproved of them. 
This is a holy place. Don't do these kinds of things in a place like this. What to you? Don't tell us what we can and can't do. What do you think of yourself? A holy man? You're no holy man. What you're doing isn't right. Your inner demon shall possess you. None but a holy man will be able to save you from it. Elisa, leave it. Let's just go from here. When Mr. Wells learned of the homeless man who had cursed his daughter, he went out in search for him. But he was unable to find the man again. Mr. Wells feared it was this curse that had turned his daughter into this. So he began searching for a holy man. Every time a preacher arrived to town, he requested them to come visit his daughter. But none had been successful in healing her. And neither would Lewis read. What's wrong with her? He said, stumbling back. To the outside world, Lewis Reed was a faith healer, a man blessed with holy powers. But only Lewis and his crew knew the truth. Every time Lewis made an appearance in a certain city or town, he would first send his men to fulfill a very essential part of their scheme. Bethany and Marshall were set up by him to move to this town and interact with the people. They were to create an impression that they had an apparent disability and were faithless people. They would maintain the act for three months until, when the great Louis Reed would make his appearance to town, neighboring folk would invite them to a seminar, in which Louis Reed would perform his miracles, just like he did with Bethany, who innocently pretended she had believed, and in the process, strengthened the faith of others and brought innocent people to blind faith. Louis Reed was but a fraud. But standing in front of Alyssa, he knew this was no act. This young woman was possessed. What would he do? Another, Another one. one. Yes, this is Ronaldo de Souza Faria. His friends and family all call him Ronnie, but he's also known as the Pequeno Pele of the small town of Moretes in Brazil. Every day after school, Ronnie came out to the local field almost half an hour from his home to play with his friends. He was only 15 years old, but he had a strong passion for playing football. He was the best player on his team, and with him, they always won. Ronnie didn't have much focus on his studies. Rather, his life was all about football, something his parents wouldn't understand. Ronnie was their only child, but as much as they loved him, they were awfully strict and possessive about him. Ronnie had a strict curfew time. He had to be home before sunset at any cost. Living in a town nestled in the luscious Atlantic forests of Brazil, the weather was almost always hot and moist. But today, the skies were covered with dark gray clouds. Ronnie had gotten so caught up in the match, he didn't notice where time had gone, and he was late. Looking up at the skies, he knew it might just start raining any moment. And if he returned home late, drenched in muck and mud, he would have to hear a whole lot from his mother. But worse, this could be the last time he'd get to play football. Ronnie waved goodbye to his buddies and ran off the field on his way back home. But who was he kidding? He knew he was never going to make it back on time. But perhaps there was something he could do. Ronnie stared across the street at the path that led through the forest to the other side. Not a lot of people used this route, and neither did Ronnie, but today he was in need of a shortcut. He would run all the way home, it wouldn't take much time crossing over. He would be there in half the time. So Ronnie sprinted across the street and began running through the forest. About five minutes into running, Ronnie stopped to take a breath of air. The trees were swaying side to side in the heavy winds. The weather was actually quite soothing. He slowed down and walked the mud path, brushing his hair back. The drops of sweat trickled down his forehead, cooled him down in the swift breeze. 
suddenly getting a feeling someone was walking behind him. Ronnie turned back, but there was no one there, as he expected. He began jogging again, but for some reason he kept getting an odd feeling like someone was following him. After looking back a few times, he shrugged it off and quickened his pace. Maybe it was just the heavy winds. Only a 15 minutes journey through the forest, Ronnie reached the other side and climbed up onto the road. Home was only five minutes away now. He ran down the block, stopping at the last turn, when suddenly he heard a voice from the opposite direction. He turned to see one of his father's close friends and also his neighbor, Uncle Estevio, calling him to stop. Ronnie turned around and hurried up to him. Yes, Uncle Estevio. Aren't you late to get home? Yeah, that's why I was hurrying. Ronnie, did you take the forest path in this stormy weather? Ronnie quickly shook his head. No, I ran all the way here. Uncle Estevio sternly looked at him. Son, never take that path again. If you're late, your parents might scold you, but that's better than falling into danger. These forests aren't a good place. And always remember, if you are ever walking down a forest path and anyone calls your name from behind, never respond or even look back, especially not when it's dark. Ronnie nervously nodded. Okay, uncle. Now go. Your mom and dad are probably getting worried. Phew. Ronnie quickly turned to hurry down the block. He only got away because it was Uncle Estevio. If it were his mom and dad, he would definitely be in trouble. When Ronnie reached his house, he found his mother standing on the porch, holding her hips. Where were you? Is this the time you were supposed to come home? Mai, it's not sunset yet. It's only dark because of the clouds. His mother pointed inside the house. Go and freshen up. She twisted Ronnie's ears as he passed by her. Su menino traveso. Luckily, Ronnie didn't get into trouble that day. He freshened up and hurried to the table, smelling the comforting aroma of, of bajeado, the best beef stew you could eat in Brazil. Mai, I'm going to compete in the finale match next week. But have you forgotten your final exams are also next week? Mai, come on. Why do you always have to bring up studies? All right, all right. Now finish up. Here, take some more. We did it! The next week, Ronnie played the best he ever had. He scored two goals and was awarded a medal. And today, even if he was a little bit late, maybe his mother would overlook it. It was almost sunset by the time the match was over and the winners were given their prizes. Ronnie celebrated a little with his buddies and finally headed towards home. Not thinking too much of it, he sprinted across the street to the path through the forest. He was pretty exhausted and wanted to get some rest. The weather was clear out today, and there was no sign of rain or wind. Though it had gotten pretty dark, Ronnie wasn't in much worry knowing he would be home in 15 minutes or so. However, a distance into walking, when he could no longer see the main road behind him, he started to get a little uneasy again. That strange feeling that someone was behind him, someone would walk up to him at any moment. <laughs> Ronnie became nervous, hearing a sudden laughter behind him. He could just barely make out a figure through the corner of his eyes. But he didn't have the courage to look back. As he continued walking, he began to hear a voice. The soft voice of a young woman calling him. Where are you going? Remembering what his uncle had told him, Ronnie quickened his pace, but it seemed that the young woman only got closer and closer to him. Ronnie could clearly hear the sound of her feet touching the leaves and twigs on the forest ground. I know you can hear me. Ronnie's heart raced as he fought the urge to turn around and gaze upon this young woman. Where did she come from? Or was his mind just playing tricks on him? Suddenly, Ronnie heard the rustling sound of the leaves as those footsteps started to become heavy. They started to run his way. Turn around. Turn around, Ronnie. The moment Ronnie heard the young woman utter his name, he became so frightened and startled. 
He dropped the medal from his hands. Ronnie ran down his block in a rush to get home when he saw his uncle Estevio waiting for him outside. Ronnie, where were you? Everyone was looking for you. You had a match today, right? Ronnie sighed. Yes, my team won. I scored two goals. Then where's your medal? Ronnie nervously turned to look at his house. I have to get home, uncle, he said as he started walking back. Ronnie, did you see anything? But without answering, Ronnie sprinted to his house. When he got there, he found the door open. He softly stepped inside and took off his shoes when his parents called out from the living room. Ronnie, where were you? What happened? Did you lose the game? No, we won. Then what? You didn't score any goals? No, I did. Seeing Ronnie looking absolutely drained, his mother didn't ask anything more. Go take some rest. I'll get food ready. After dinner that night, Ronnie lay in bed, feeling anxious. He closed his eyes, trying not to think about anything, and soon fell asleep. He woke up in the middle of the night. Laying in bed, he felt the cool breeze blow through his window. The curtains fluttered through the air, letting in the moonlight that brightened the dark room. Ronnie. Ronnie turned to see that young woman. Ronnie had to get out of here, but no matter how much he tried, he couldn't move. He felt as if his body was paralyzed. The young woman looked at him and smiled. Come with me, Ronnie, she said as she started climbing the bed. Come with me, Ronnie. No, you know you want me. Ronnie, wake up, wake up. Ronnie woke up to his mother shaking him. He was drenched in sweat, feeling awfully anxious. What happened? You were making noises in your sleep. It was just a bad dream. Your exams are today. Hurry and get ready for school. Ronnie had a hard time focusing at school that day. All he could think about was that horrifying dream he had. When he came home, he felt as if all his energy was being drained out of him. He didn't even have the strength to get out of bed and have dinner that night and fell asleep early. But it was within a few hours that Ronnie woke up from a high fever. His mother gave him some meds, but it didn't seem to have any effect on him. The fever isn't coming down. It's been almost two days. Let the boy rest. He needs a break from football. He's been playing too much. His body isn't handling the stress well. Mr. and Mrs. D'Souza supposed their son would heal within a few days of rest. But when four days went by and Ronnie's condition only worsened, they started to get worried. His teacher had called in to inquire why he wasn't attending school and informed them that he had performed poorly in all his exams. The parents didn't tell Ronnie anything. At this point, all they wanted was their son to return to good health. Since Ronnie had been suffering from this high fever, he felt so weak. Falling asleep was difficult enough, but once Ronnie would drift off, he feared he wouldn't be able to get up again. Every night, he saw that young woman. Come with me, Ronnie. You and I will be together, Ronnie. Ronnie wouldn't be able to move a limb as the girl neared him. The experiences would be horrifying. He would feel like suffocating, like he was trapped in his dreams and there was no way of escape unless someone woke him up. When a week went by and Ronnie wasn't showing any sign of recovery, his parents called in a doctor but the sleeping aid he was prescribed wasn't of much use. Every morning, Mrs. D'Souza would have to wake up her son from his nightmares. Ronnie became so fearful of the dreams, he began forcing himself to stay awake, but that only made him even more sick. He had lost a significant amount of weight in the past week, there were dark circles under his eyes, and he had absolutely no energy in him. How is he doing now? We've been trying everything. The doctor gave him some medication, but nothing is working. When Uncle Estevio heard of Ronnie's sickness, he came to meet him. He was shocked seeing the young boy's condition when he stepped into his room. Ronnie, how are you feeling? Not well, Uncle. Did you see something that evening? Did you leave anything behind? 
The look on Ronnie's face suddenly turned pale, but Ronnie knew he had to tell the truth. My medal. I was walking down that path, and I saw her. I got so scared, my medal fell from my hands. The next morning, I went back and got my medal again. And since then, I've fallen sick. I've been feeling so dreadful. I see her in my dreams every night. Uncle Estavio furrowed his brows. You shouldn't have. He got up and looked around the room. Where is it? Ronnie struggled to lift his hand and pointed to the shelf across the room. Uncle Estavio took the medal and sat down besides Ronnie. She's gotten hold of you through this. We have to get rid of it. He then took out his pocket knife and snipped a chunk of Ronnie's hair before he got up to leave. Don't worry and try to rest. I'll see what I can do. Ronnie anxiously lay in bed as Uncle Estavio left the house with the medal. That evening, he went to the local graveyard. He dug a grave and placed the metal inside and Ronnie's hair on top of it. With this, perhaps, it would deceive the demon that took hold of the boy into thinking he was dead. Hopefully, she would then let him go. Annabelle and Marshall first met about eight years ago in New York City. Annabelle had moved there for college, leaving behind her family in Woodbury, Long Island. And Marshall moved all the way from upstate Buffalo in search of a job. It seemed that fate had somehow united them, because it was soon after that they started dating, and two years later ended up getting married. They both rented a small apartment and were trying to make it work. Soon, Marshall got a good job and Annabelle completed her studies. And not long after, did they welcome a new member to their small family, Danny. At first, the couple managed well. But once Danny grew into his toddler years, the parents realized they needed a bigger home. That's when Marshall and Annabelle decided to move to Annabelle's family house in Woodbury that she inherited a few years prior when her mother passed away. Now, not only would they have a spacious home where Danny could grow up, the small welcoming community. Danny, now that you're going to have your own room, you'll have to sleep on your own, all right, buddy? All right, daddy. Wow, haven't been here since mom's funeral. This house is still like before. The family rather easily coped into the new environment, enrolling Danny into the nearby elementary school, while Annabelle was busy rearranging the house. Hey, Danny, heads up. I got it, dad, I got it. Looks like we'll have to head in, champ. It might start raining soon. Oh, man. It was their first weekend at the house. Marshall and Danny were playing out in the yard when he noticed one of their neighbors pass by. Afternoon, Mr. Peterson. Afternoon, Marshall. How are things going? Great. As Mr. Peterson walked on, Danny walked up to his dad. Mom used to have a crush on him. What? Mr. Peterson? Yep. As the rain suddenly began to pour, Marshall and Danny rushed inside. And as Danny went off to play, Marshall searched for Annabelle, a bit curious and amused by Danny's comments. You never told me you had a crush on that fat, bald, old man Peterson. Annabelle turned around in surprise. You don't know how he used to look like when he was 18, okay? And that was back when I was 9 years old. He wasn't fat or bald, for your information. Yeah, sure. Oh, stop, Marshall. How did you even know that anyways? Danny told me. Danny? How did Danny know? Wild guess? Annabelle herself had long gotten over and forgotten about her little secret crush. But it was sure strange, out of all people, Danny would be the one to remind her. How could he know? He had never even met any of her relatives. 
but whatever it was, Annabelle brushed it off. Sharp on Monday morning, Marshall was to be off on his two-hour drive to work in the city, and Danny on his way to school. Danny, are you ready? Let's go. Dad, no, I don't want to go in the car. Marshall turned to look at his son anxiously stepping away from their car. Why, buddy? What's wrong? I don't like going in the car. Since when? You used to like it before. All right, buddy. We'll walk today. The days were going by fine. Annabelle met some new neighbors and easily learned her way around the familiar neighborhood again. Marshall had everything figured out, and Danny too was doing well. It was one afternoon when Marshall had gone to pick him up after school. His teacher, Mrs. Meridou, called him aside for a talk. Hello, Mr. Schultz. How are you? Doing well? How are you? How's Danny doing? Danny is actually doing incredibly well. I was wondering if he gets extra help at home. Well, sometimes I try to help out with his homework and sometimes his mother. Danny's been very impressive. He's the only student in my kindergarten class that knows how to do math at a third grade level. Very smart boy. Mrs. Meridou couldn't stop praising Danny, and though Marshall was impressed himself, he was surprised how Danny caught on to third grade level so fast. Dad, can we have ice cream? Sure, but first you tell me, how did you do your homework? Mommy always helps me. Hmm, mommy. After having their little treat for a job well done or a prank cleverly pulled, Marshall and Danny went home. Annabelle, have you been helping Danny with his homework lately? His teacher couldn't stop praising him today. Yeah, I used to, but Danny's been doing so well, he's been doing it all by himself. He doesn't need my help anymore. So it was really him? The whole week had been rainy and stormy, and tonight the rain poured heavily over the roof once again. Danny, come down for dinner. Danny! I'll go see what that Einstein is doing. Marshall walked upstairs to get his son. When he stopped a distance from Danny's room, hearing Danny talking, Marshall peeked inside to see his son playing by the window with his toys. Danny, who were you talking to? With Mommy. Mommy? Mommy's been calling you from the kitchen for so long. Come on, let's go have dinner. Okay, Daddy. I didn't know imaginary friends could also be Mommy. The days in the house were going by. Oftentimes, Marshall caught Danny doing the silliest things. Like talking all by himself or staying awake in the middle of the night. What are you doing up, buddy? Mommy woke me up. Looks like you had a bad dream. Mommy's not here. Come on, get in bed. After a week of constant rain, the weather had cleared up just a little. The parents were planning for a fun day out. But it was sometime midday that Annabelle suddenly got a call from Mrs. Meridou, requesting her and Marshall to visit her for a talk, and she seemed a bit off. Annabelle couldn't imagine what it was about. But she and Marshall curiously went after school to see Danny sitting by her table. Yes, Mrs. Meridou? Is everything okay? Danny, why don't you go get a book and sit in the classroom? Okay, Mrs. Meridou. As Danny rushed off searching for a book from the shelf, the parents sat down, concerned as Mrs. Meridou took out some pieces of paper. Today I handed out these assignments to my students. I asked them to write about a memorable experience of theirs. Alright. Marshall and Annabelle looked at the work. Some kids wrote about a day at the amusement park, or the time they went to an ice cream parlor. But after a moment of silence, Mrs. Meridou took out Danny's work and handed them. Danny wrote about the experience of a painful death. Excuse me? I was just as shocked as you are, Mr. Charles. The parents read Danny's paper, shocked. The day I died. I felt tremendous pain in my head and my nose. I felt a sharp sting in my ribs. My body began to shake. Everything started to go black in front of my eyes, and soon, I couldn't feel the pain anymore. 
I had died. Mrs. Meridu, I don't understand why Danny would write something like this, but we'll surely have a talk with him. Take care, Mr. and Mrs. Charles. After Marshall and Annabelle got home, they looked at each other not knowing where to start. Alas, they sat Danny down. Danny, you wrote something in Mrs. Meridu's class today. Yes? About death. How did you know all that? I don't know. The parents passed each other a confused glance. Alright, Danny. Let's not write things like this again, okay? Okay. With that, Danny jumped off his chair and off to his room. Maybe he read it somewhere or saw it on TV. It could be a ton of things. Hmm. Intrigued by Danny's recent behavior, Marshall felt a little worried for his son. So he started to keep an eye on Danny through his old baby monitor. It was one of these days while Danny had gone to bed and Marshall was in his room reading a book that he suddenly began to hear a sound from the baby monitor. Startled, he turned up the volume and listened to Danny. I miss you so much, Mommy. Why do you leave me? I don't like staying by myself. Marshall leaned back, returning to his book, when he heard another voice. It was Annabelle. I'm always with you, Danny. Don't be sad. We'll be together forever. Marshall smiled, listening to his wife hum a lullaby to Danny. When suddenly, he was startled when Annabelle walked into the room with a pile of laundry. Annabelle? Did you just come from Danny's room? No. I went down to the basement to get the laundry. What? Then who is he talking with? Marshall picked up the baby monitor and tried to listen closely, but hearing no sound, he dropped it and rushed to Danny's room. But to his surprise, Danny was sound asleep. What did he hear? Or did he just imagine it? Annabelle, I swear I heard him talking through the baby monitor. And then I heard a voice reply to him. I thought it was you. What? You must have heard something else. Annabelle put the matter aside, thinking it probably had to have some rational explanation. But Marshall couldn't stop thinking about it. The very next day, while Danny was at school, he went out to buy a camera for his room and installed them. Now we can keep an eye on him all night. He's been sleeping fine, Marshall. Why are you getting so worried? It's better safe than sorry. He's been waking up a lot at night. That night, Marshall anxiously waited listening to the baby monitor. But it was silent, and the couple soon went to sleep. But it was towards the middle of the night that Annabelle woke up hearing a noise. At first, she thought Marshall was checking up on Danny. But then, she found Marshall sleeping beside her. Curious, she pressed the baby monitor to her ears. Shocked to hear a faint humming sound. Mommy, I missed you. I'm here now, sweetheart. I don't want to leave you, Mommy. Hearing her own voice, Annabelle anxiously turned on the camera. To see something in Danny's room, standing with her son. She immediately ran out and barged in, devastated to see Danny climbing the window. Danny, stop! Danny, don't move! I want to go with mommy, Danny said, holding her hand. Annabelle broke down into tears as she pleaded. Please, don't do this. I'm sorry. Don't take my child. But Danny stepped his one foot out to jump. Danny, no! Danny froze, startled by his mother, as she ran to hold him, but in the process, she pushed him aside and slipped from the window herself. Annabelle Zimmerman grew up in this house with her twin sister, Isabel. But it was some time before their 11th birthday that Isabel passed away in an accident, or so everyone believed. But it wasn't the reality. 
Annabelle had always been jealous of Isabel. She was better at everything than her. Mom, I won the art contest. Wow, Annabelle, I'm so proud of you. Isabel, your painting is beautiful too. How about we hang both of them up? Okay. Although their parents never prioritized one over the other, and they always treated both daughters equally and loved them equally, the bitter truth was that Annabelle didn't feel the same towards her sister. She was jealous of Isabel, and she wished she didn't have a twin. She wanted to be on her own. So it was one day, while the two were playing outside, Annabelle had pushed Isabel out of rage. Losing control of her rollerblades, she slipped onto the road and in front of a car. Hearing the crash, their parents ran out, calling an ambulance. But Isabel passed away from severe injury to her skull and ribs. And though they mourned the death of their daughter, Annabelle heartlessly felt content. But now after all these years, when even their parents were no more, Annabelle never imagined one day she would meet Isabel again. Hearing a loud thud outside, Marshall got up startled to see Annabelle wasn't beside him. He ran to Danny's room to see him standing all alone by the window. Danny, get away from there, what happened? Mommy fell down. Chuck isn't here yet? What to you, Betty? When are you finally going to admit you have a crush on him? Shh, Peggy. There they are. Elizabeth and Margaret were waiting for their friends Charles and Thomas in the middle of the cornfield that belonged to Elizabeth's family. All the friends lived close by, and this was their favorite place to meet up, where they often hung out. The two girls were wondering what had the guys held up just when they heard them walking through the cornstalks. What took you so long? Yum, give me that. My cousins came over. The family's having a barbecue. Then don't you need to be there? Huh, yeah, I wanted to stay and enjoy the food, but Chuck had to drag me here like he can go a day without meeting Peggy. That's so not true. You don't know how weird my cousins are. My little cousin, Bill, he got a cut on his face, and my aunt put a dog cone on his neck so he can't pick on the scab. No way, I have to see that. Trust me, you don't want to meet them. It was a relaxing day out. The tall corn stalks all swayed side to side in the wind. It was the perfect weather for chilling outside. The friends sat down sharing, or rather, looting poor Tom's corn on the cob, when a huge gust of wind blew through the stalks throwing off the hat on top of the scarecrow that stood right behind them. Whoops, you gotta hold on to that hat, big brother. Betty got up picking up the hat and sticking it back on the scarecrow with her hairband. Now that should help it stay put. Yeah, why don't you put a flower on his head too? Make him look like a sissy scarecrow. He doesn't look sissy at all, Tom. It's cute. Yeah, like a flowered scarecrow is going to shoo off the creepy crows around here. Charles took a twig from the ground and stuck it into the scarecrow's mouth. There, a good smoke is what he needs after all you two girls do to him. Right, big brother? Thomas chuckled as he sneaked behind the scarecrow and moved its head. What? Tell me that was the wind. You guys saw that, right? You're so gullible, Peggy. Get out from behind there, Tom. This scarecrow was actually like a pinpoint landmarker for the friends to get to their meeting place. It was back when they were just about 10 years old that they made the scarecrow all together with their very own old shirts, pants, scarves, and hat. They stuffed the clothes up with dry corn stalks and hay into an eight foot gigantic man who they all teased and called Big Brother. Over the years, the friends put their own touches to it the scarecrow was like a magnet to many jokes 
sometimes rage and sometimes cries when the friends would fight with each other and then make up with each other. As a matter of fact, two of the friends shared a secret with their big brother. Sometimes when Elizabeth wasn't feeling too great due to various teenage girl problems, she sneaked out in the middle of the night to the cornfield. And of those many days, one night, she was surprised to find Tom sitting on the bench, doing something he wasn't supposed to do. What are you doing here at this time? Isn't that what I should be asking you? Big Brother hides my secret treats for me. You know what my dad would do if he finds out? You're such a sneaky little pest. I was wondering why my parents grounded me last week. It was you. Hey, thanks for covering up for me. I didn't even know. All right, all right, I owe you. Now tell me, why the teary eyes? Did you guys hear BII is holding a concert here in Blue Rapids? A lot of celebrities are coming. Yeah, they've been on a tour across the states and now they're finally here in Kansas. The concert is gonna be awesome, man. We so have to go. I'm gonna break my piggy bank for this. I already bought my tickets with two weeks of allowance. Then I guess you guys are going without me. I know I'm gonna run short. No, you're not. What are we here for? I have some money saved up. I'll pay for half of your one. But you guys, there's one catch. The catch. The concert was being held at midnight at a venue by the Big Blue River, which was about a 30 minute travel from where the friends lived. The concert was for those 18 and older, and the friends were 16, apart from Tom, who was 15, which really didn't make the situation any better. When they told their parents, and they all received a big no. At midnight? Are you crazy? Do you know what happens at concerts like these? Look at this girl in the poster. You're gonna have old and pneumonia dressed like that. Is this a joke? Just look at these boys and girls. What is up with the tongue sticking out and the spiky hair? Who listens to music this loud anyway? The only concert you're going to is the choir that's being held on Sunday at the town square. It will be an occasion to remember. Your little sister is participating in it this year. Tell all your friends to come. Trust me, this time, the choir is gonna rock your socks off. Don't even think about it, Tom. You're not going anywhere. But mom, I bought tickets. All my friends are gonna be waiting for me then I guess you just wasted your allowance. It's a no. What are we going to do? The concert is in three days. My dad's being judgmental again. No, they're our parents, Betty. They know better than us. They gave birth to us, fed us, clothed us. They're always there physically and emotionally for us. Spend millions on us already. We have to. We have to lie and sneak out. I mean, I don't see any other way. Good idea. We can all sneak out, but how are we going to get that far? You don't expect to walk 30 minutes and back. We're going to get caught. We can always ride our bikes over there. It'll take half the time. And so three days later on Friday, the friends were all on their best behavior from dawn to dusk. Doing chores, reading. They even had their dinner on time with the family at the table and went to bed just like everyone else in the house. And as soon as it hit 11, Elizabeth, Charles, Margaret, and Thomas all sneaked out their windows and met up on the main road with their bikes. What's wrong, Betty? You're shivering like a fat turkey in front of a gun on Thanksgiving. I'm fat? What, I don't look good enough for you? I was just scared because I've never sneaked out before. Forget it. Like you can never understand what I go through, Chuck. What's that supposed to mean? Is it your time of the month or something? Whoa, bro, you don't mess with girls like that. When they're upset, you leave them alone. What did I do? Don't look at me. You're blinder than a bat, Chuck. And the friends rode all the way to the Big Blue River, where they easily made it through with their tickets and a few smiles from Elizabeth and Margaret. The concert was awesome, and Charles even got an autograph and a picture with the lead singer. Fun fact, 
Guys are polygamous by nature, so you might as well get over it. It's science. Stop being a jerk, Tom. I will, as soon as you man up and accept the truth, Peggy. At around 2 a.m., the concert was finally over. The friends all sat down by the field and enjoyed some tacos from a nearby street food vendor before they all got on their bikes back home. The streets were dark, and there weren't any street lamps in the remote area they lived. Margaret was holding up a flashlight on her bike handle with which all the friends were navigating their way. Tonight was so awesome. Totally worth it, even if we get into trouble. Dude, we had a legitimate excuse. B.I.I. would be holding a concert and we wouldn't go? Suddenly, Margaret took a stop, spotting something shift in the woods beside them. You guys saw that? The friends hit their brakes to a rustle in the bushes. As they widened their eyes, seeing a coyote jump out, pacing along the road, staring at them. Don't go near it, or look at it. I heard these animals are fierce. There's no kicking them off if they decide to bite. Chuck, you always say the worst things at the worst time. No, he's right. We should hurry home. But as the friends paddled their bikes as fast as they could down the lonely road, they started to notice a few more coyotes running along with them through the woods. What the... Are they following us? That's not a good sign. Any of you have a knife? Or something? Tom? I have one. But what good is a small pocket knife gonna do? We need a bazooka for this one. I can see the cornfield from here. We'll be safe as soon as we get out of this wooded area. Let's just get home as fast as possible. As soon as the friends reached the open cornfields, it seemed that the coyotes had run off into the darkness of the woods again. Phew, that was a close call. Peggy, Tom, Betty, look. Or so they thought. From between the corn stalks, the friends stared at a pack of coyotes walk out, growling at them viciously. They turned their bikes to take another route. When they realized these animals were not just in front of them, but behind them as well. The friends all grabbed onto their bikes, planning to throw them at the animals and flee. But when the coyotes began barking and coming their way, the friends all froze in fear. What are we gonna do? No one can hear us from here. No one is awake to hear us. Just as Thomas and Charles were about to lift their bikes, all the friends froze to a loud noise from the cornfields. What is that? They heard loud thuds on the ground, one after the other, as the corn stalks eerily rustled. Are those footsteps? The friends were all thundered to notice someone they recognized. An eight feet tall scarecrow jumped out of the cornfield, towering over the coyotes. It swooped down low, clawing the animals with its sharp, branch hands. Elizabeth was dumbfounded. She couldn't move from her place. Margaret was shivering in fear. Charles and Thomas pulled onto the girls, all fleeing from there. They stopped far in the distance, trembling as they looked back. This can't be real. Was that... Big... Brother?
Ethan Graham is an international reporter who works, or rather used to work, for the IIB Broadcasting Network. He was fed up with the prejudice, biasness, and ethics of the news broadcasting channels and therefore quit his job. The tension arose ever since he arrived to this country. Ethan was not sure what to believe until he stepped foot on the land himself. He realized the situation here was far from the lies he had been fed. Here, one side was inhumanely overpowering the other. The land that belonged to the people of the country were being unjustly taken from them, their homes being seized. People were suffering, men, women, and children were devastated, treated unfairly. Once happy families were now being erased in the blink of an eye. Families were now broken, children without their parents, parents without their children, wives without their husbands, and husbands without their wives. Ethan couldn't bear what these people were going through. He wanted this to end. The world needed to be aware of what was going on. What is this report? We can't telecast this. Call Graham right now. What nonsense have you sent? Not nonsense, the truth. You weren't assigned to send the truth. Your job was to report the narrative that would make our sponsors and our politicians happy. We're not in a truth-telling business. We're here to make money, and to make money, we have to keep our politicians and sponsors happy. Make a report in a way so the truth becomes blurred. So you want me to make the victims appear as perpetrators? Men, women, and children who are suffering, deprived of their property, land, and life as the transgressors? To make the victim's side appear blemish, supporting and whitewashing the side of your sponsors and politicians? That is exactly what you're going to do. Find someone else. I quit. The city was four hours from here, and Ethan was on his way. He rolled down his windows, letting in the moist breeze as he drove down an endless road in what was a seemingly beautiful, peaceful place. If only people knew what was really happening here. As he sped down the road, the thunder began rumbling loudly. Ethan looked to the skies as flashes of lightning were bright through the gray clouds. Men, women, children, young and old, are all suffering, who have never done wrong to anyone. Lord, are you really there? As the sun began to set, all of a sudden, the rain began to pour. It was becoming difficult to drive, and before long, Ethan found himself stuck on this lonely road. His engine had failed, and no matter how much he tried, tinkering under the hood in the rain, it was of no use. He looked around to see if he could spot anyone or anything, but for miles and miles, there was nothing. He attempted to catch a signal on his phone, but there was no network either. Ethan shrugged as he walked down the road in the rain. He scanned the area again, when his eyes spotted something a bit far up ahead. It was a building. Suddenly seeing a flash of lightning hit the grounds towards the mountain ranges, Ethan thought he'd start walking. Perhaps he could find help there. About a 10 minute hike down the road and into the mud path that led to the stone house, he reached what seemed to be a monastery. He took shade under the roof and lifted the metal handles knocking on the door. Within a while, an elderly man opened the door. Yes, my son? I was traveling through this area when my car broke down and my phone doesn't have any network. Will it be possible for me to call for help from here? No, my son. There are no telephones in this house of worship. This place is very isolated and the nearest phone is five miles from here in the market. Is there any way I can get there? You won't find any transport here, and you won't make it in this weather. Stay here for the night, and perhaps tomorrow you can walk to the market and arrange your transport. Seeing no other choice, Ethan decided to lodge at the monastery for the night. He followed the elderly man inside. The building was quite old, but it was spacious and quiet, so much so that their two lone voices echoed in the air. The elderly man escorted Ethan to a room. There lay a simple cot and a small table with a lantern placed on it. 
There was no electricity in this monastery. Rest here while I bring you some dry clothes. My clothes are actually in my suitcase, but I've left it in my car. No need to go out in the rain again. Tonight, you're my guest. You can wear my clothes. With that, the elderly man turned to leave. When Ethan asked him, Is there a washroom here? Yes, two doors down to your left. Do take the lantern with you. As the elderly man left, Ethan took his lantern and went to the washroom. This was definitely not what he was used to, but he would have to manage. There was nothing in the room except for a pail of water stored to the side. There weren't even mirrors. In the dim light of the fire, Ethan washed himself with the cold water and returned to his room where he found clothes left for him on the cot. It was a robe. Ethan wore it but felt awfully shy to step out wearing clothes like this. He sat down trying to relax when the elderly man knocked on his door again. You probably haven't eaten. I've prepared dinner. Please join me. So Ethan followed the man down the hall and out to the back of the monastery. Under the shade of the patio, the elderly man had a fire running and a pot of stew cooking on an earthen stove. The rain poured incessantly and the winds were heavy, making the tree sway side to side. Noticing the pail of water the elderly man had fetched, Ethan realized there were no arrangements for water either. Down by the tree, there was a well. The elderly man laid down a mat and served some bread and two steaming bowls of soup. Sit down. Thank you. Ethan picked up the bread and had a bite, but it was coarse and hard and difficult to chew. Dip your bread in the soup, it'll be easier for you. The elderly man said as he did the same. Ethan tore the bread and soaked it in the soup. He was surprised by how good it tasted. What is this? This tastes so good. Vegetable soup with some gourd and cauliflower. I grow these vegetables myself. It's wonderful. After the two men had their food, they sat on the patio watching the rain. The weather is so nice. This is a great blessing of the Lord. We should be grateful to Him. By this age of yours, you've seen so much in life. You must have so much experience, and you know what is going on, and you still believe in the Lord? My son, you're right. I've lived a long life, I've seen many things, and I know what is going on, but that is why I believe in the Lord. But how? Because, if there was no Lord, darkness would only have prevailed and never ceased. How many nations, empires, and dynasties were there who were so powerful that no one could have destroyed? But where are they today? In the dust. They're all in the dust. If there was no Lord, their rule would have never ended. Everything has an appointed term. After that term is fulfilled, no ruler can rule, no oppressor can oppress, and no victim shall suffer. Everything in this world is only temporary. Listening to the elderly man gave Ethan some peace of mind. This is so true. I never thought about it like that. After a moment of silence, Ethan asked again, Do you live all alone in this monastery? There was a time when there were holy men, men better than me, who used to live here. We used to educate and preach to the people. Life was simple and beautiful, but they're no more. I am the last of them, and now I live here, all alone. Don't you feel lonely? No, life is good. I grow my own vegetables. Sometimes I go to the market. I cook my own food. I enjoy the weather, and I praise the Lord. As the night skies became dark, the elderly man picked up his lantern. It's been quite some time after sunset. I wake up before sunrise every morning, so let's try to sleep. But if you have trouble sleeping, you can come here to watch the nature. You're in a holy place. Remember the Lord. It will bring peace to your heart. But you mustn't go to the far east end of the monastery. It's not a good place. Thank you, and good night. Ethan returned to his room and laid down on the cot. As soon as he turned off the lantern, the room fell dark. He checked his watch. It was only 8 p.m. He closed his eyes, listening to the droplets of rain, and soon fell asleep. But it wasn't long before Ethan woke up again. Only two hours had passed. The rain still hadn't stopped, and now Ethan lay wide awake. 
After some time, he thought he'd take a walk around the monastery. This would probably be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for him. He walked down the halls with his lantern, remembering what the elderly man had said about the Far East End. Why had he forbade him to go? Quite curious, Ethan made his way to the East End. But there was nothing there. He sighed as he turned to go back, when he suddenly heard a voice, a female voice. Is someone there? Can you help me? Surprised, Ethan followed the sound. When he realized it was coming from one of the walls, there was a door here he hadn't noticed. Ethan held up his lantern to a small window, staring at a young woman behind the bars. Who are you? Please help me out of here. I'm a reporter. My name is Lily. I came here with my cameraman to film a documentary on this monastery. But this old man, he's not a holy man. Don't be deceived by him. He killed my cameraman and locked me up. I've been trapped here for three months. Please help me escape. How do you open this door? Ethan noticed a heavy lock on the door and took out his multi-tool. But no matter how much he tried to pick the lock or break it, it wouldn't budge. You won't be able to open this lock without the key. The elderly man always carries it with him at his waist. It looks like a dagger, but it's actually the key to this lock. He's probably sleeping now, but he'll wake up before sunrise. Yes, I've seen it. Let me see what I can do. Ethan slowly walked back to the elderly man's room, looking inside to find him sleeping. He scanned the room to find the dagger on the table beside him. Without making noise, Ethan left his lantern outside, crept into the room, and got it. He then rushed back to the east end, where Lily was eagerly waiting for him. Thank you so much. But just as Ethan placed the key into the lock and tried to open it, he heard footsteps behind him. He turned around to see the elderly man running towards him. Stop! You don't know what you're doing! Don't do this! Ethan quickly tried to unlock the door, and just as the elderly man reached him, the lock fell to the ground. What have you done? At once, a heavy gust of wind entered the monastery, and the door flung open. Lily stepped out, suddenly letting out a laugh. <laughs> A wicked laughter that sends chills down Ethan's spine. You foolish man, how easily you men get deceived. The elderly man immediately began to chant something as he approached the woman, but she held out her hand, exerting a force so he couldn't reach her. You won't be able to overpower me. The nearer the elderly man came to her, his clothes and skin began to burn, but he chanted louder. Lord of Light, bless me with strength. All of a sudden, Lily felt furious as a force pushed her back into the room. Seeing the opportunity, Ethan got up and closed the gate and hurried to put the lock on. No! As Lily yelled, trying to break free, Ethan rushed to help the elderly man. I have to take you to the hospital. No, my son, it's time. I'm sorry, all this happened because of me. It was the will of the Lord that brought you here. You must be a good man, a man with a pure heart. Centuries ago, the holy men of this house of worship, men with pure heart, had managed to subdue this woman, Lilith, and locked her here. She is not what she seems. She is the supreme deceiver. If you think the world is covered with darkness, you don't know what she's capable of. In his last breath, the elderly man handed Ethan the dagger. Never set her free. Earl Olson and his wife, Nora Olson, lived in a cabin by Lake Bemidji in Minnesota. They had been married for about 10 years, and it was about seven years ago that they moved to the town of Bemidji and started their own small logging business. 
Earl was a lumberjack. He sold timber and firewood along with various types of other wood. However, the most abundant in the forest near his home were short-leaf pine trees. Pine wood was really good for making high-value carpentry items, like furniture, floors, and roofing. Pine was also great timber and fuel wood. Once Earl had saved a sum of money, he and his wife started a wood crafting business together. They built a small wood workshop next to their cabin, where Nora designed various pieces of furniture and Earl made them with his own hands and sold them in town. Over only a few years, they had gathered many customers, and with the income they made, it was sufficient for the two of them and, of course, their beloved dog, Baxter. Life was pretty simple in Bemidji. Every morning, Earl would rent a boat at the dock with which he and Baxter would go to the other side of the lake into the pine forest. This area was quiet. Nobody lived around here for miles. Once Earl had felled a tree, he would then have to buck the tree and make quite a few trips back to the dock with all his logs. Go boy, fetch! Earl picked up a twig and threw it far in the distance. He watched Baxter go after it as he started walking the way himself. The air smelt like fresh pine, a scent he admired since childhood. It always reminded him of the holidays. A house filled with the scent of pumpkin spice coffee and gingerbread, it was the best time of the year. When it had been a while and Baxter hadn't returned, Earl began to search for him. He suddenly started to hear Baxter growling and barking loudly. Earl soon caught sight of his dog and also discovered a small cabin. He wasn't aware people lived on the other side of the lake in this forest area. Baxter had been barking and aggressively pushing over the fence, so much so that he broke the wooden post and jumped to the other side. Suddenly, a young woman opened the door of her cabin and stepped out staring at the dog in rage. Baxter suddenly began barking at her. Down, Baxter! Earl yelled in a loud voice, but Baxter didn't pay heed to his command. Earl couldn't make sense of Baxter's strange behavior. He was also surprised to see that the young woman neither moved from her place nor asked for help. Earl hurried to put Baxter on a leash and pulled the dog aside. I'm so sorry, he doesn't usually behave like this. Earl looked back at the woman holding Baxter down. I apologize for the damage, I can repair it for you if you like. The young woman didn't respond to Earl. She shifted her gaze to him and glared at him with a strange look on her face. It made Earl a bit uneasy. He quickly said, I, I'll return with the wooden fence for you tomorrow. Trying not to make eye contact, Earl rubbed his dog's head to calm him. What is it, boy? What's bothering you? Come on, let's go from here. The whole morning, Baxter continued to behave strange. It was like he was untamable. He continued to bark and tried to run off. Earl had to keep him tied to a tree while he worked. What took you so long? The food is running cold. I made chili with smoked sausages. I know, I could smell it from outside. Smells wonderful. Sit down. You look a little tensed. Is everything okay? Something really strange happened today. I came across a cabin in the middle of the forest. Baxter was behaving really odd. He never did anything like this before. It's like he went rogue. He broke the fence and tried to attack the woman that lived there. That's strange. Maybe Baxter picked up on something. Dogs can sense a lot of things. Did you speak to the woman? Could be. I apologized to her, but she didn't reply to me. She just stared at me. Now that's rude. Who is she? I don't know. I didn't even know people live in these forests. Baxter seemed to calm down after he returned. However, the dog chose to stay seated by the log pile in front of Earl the whole time that he chopped wood. That was very unlike Baxter. 
The dog was usually all over the place, returning to the cabin in the evening. When night fell, Nora set out the dog food and locked up the cabin. The couple had dinner and soon went to bed. However, their sweet slumber was disrupted soon after to a knock, not from their door, but it seemed from the other side of the wall outside. At once, the couple heard Baxter barking loudly. Do you think it's an intruder? I don't know. You stay put, I'll go check it out. Earl took his axe and went out the door scanning the area. Baxter was far out by the trees, barking non-stop. After walking around the cabin, Earl didn't seem to notice any sign of intrusion, however. Baxter continued to behave aggressively. What's wrong with him? Nora said, checking Baxter's eyes. Do you think he's sick? His eyes look a little cloudy, and he's shaking a little bit. Let's let him sleep inside tonight. I don't know what's gotten into him. The couple tried to fall asleep, but Baxter whimpered and cried. Nora got up to the sound of thunder rumbling outside. It had started to rain, and the clouds in the skies covered over the full moon, making it darker than it already was. Earl hurried to cover the new piles of firewood he had chopped earlier with the large spark. As soon as Baxter saw Earl go out the door, he followed after him. Nora, get Baxter inside, it's pouring. But before Nora could get hold of Baxter, he ran towards the woods again and began barking. Just as Earl went to get him, Baxter turned around, running towards him as if he were running away from something. Earl held out his arms to get hold of the dog. Just when he froze in fear, seeing Baxter fall, not where he was, but as if something had thrown the dog to the side. Nora rushed outside, seeing what had happened. Baxter was whimpering in pain on the ground. How could this happen? Earl, look at these marks on his side. I'm getting a bad feeling, Nora said, looking out at the woods that surrounded their cabin. There's... there's something here. We have to get inside right now. It's not safe. Earl picked up the shaking dog and the couple hurried inside. They locked all their doors and windows and tried to warm up Baxter. Nora was petrified after what she saw and Earl was simply bewildered. Do you think Baxter is sensing something? Something else? That we can't? What? What are you talking about? Don't tell me about all these superstitions. They say dogs can sense strange things. They hear and see things that we can't. I don't know what's been going on, but I think there's something around here. You said you saw a woman out in the forest. These woods, it's not a good place. There are all kinds of beings out there. Spirits, spooks, ghosts and ghouls. There are also witches. Don't be ridiculous. There's a logical explanation to everything. But sometime later, something bizarre began to happen. Nora and Earl looked up at their ceiling shaking just a bit as they heard a loud thud on the roof, one after the other. Is it hailing outside? No, that's not the sound of hail. Nora peered out the curtains. It was pouring heavily, but there was no sign of any hail. When the sound continued, Earl insisted on checking outside. However, Nora didn't want to let him go. It's not safe, Earl. Nora, I have to check. We can't stay in here and wait for the roof to fall on us. It's as if someone is stomping up there. It can't be someone. It's something. Nora sat down besides Baxter, who had started to groan again. These are all signs of fear in a dog. Trembling, inability to settle. He's avoiding eye contact. Fear? Afraid of what? I don't know, but it started after you took him out this morning. When dogs become scared, they can become aggressive and even destructive at times. Didn't you say he tried to attack the woman out in the forest? It could have been anything. Maybe Baxter sniffed some fungus or some poisonous plants out there. I saw him playing with something. Maybe these are just reactions to that. We need to take him to the doctor. The couple waited and hoped for the strange occurrences to stop. 
And soon enough, the loud noises from the roof did stop, but it wasn't before long that they heard another loud crashing noise from in front of their cabin. Feeling the ground shake under them, Nora was horrified, assuming something terrible had indeed occurred. Earl peered out the window, shocked to see the large logs in front of his cabin were thrown all over the ground. The rain had slowed down and the winds weren't strong enough to throw over the logs. This was impossible considering the weight and the size. How could this happen? Nora held Earl's shoulder, now trembling in fear. We aren't safe here, Earl. There's something out there. It's after us. Just then, the cabin took a jolting shake. Earl and Nora were horrified when they realized those very logs were being thrown at the cabin. We have to get out of here. Whatever this thing is, it's going to break down the cabin. And just as they feared, the cabin began to break apart. Earl and Nora had to get out before everything would collapse onto them. Through the window in the back, the couple climbed out with their dog and fled to the dock. They watched their home crumble to the ground. There was no explanation to what happened that night. All they knew was if they had stayed there, they wouldn't have been alive to tell the story today. Anderson? John? Anderson? John? Yes, I'm here. You may go inside. The doctor will be with you in a moment. John nodded as he went inside and sat down. He had gotten into an accident today and bruised his arm badly. Within a while, Dr. Marable Richards walked inside. Good morning. Oh, wow. Looks like the morning didn't go too well, did it? Mr. Anderson? She said, looking at the wound on her patient's arm. Call me John, and I think my morning just got better upon seeing you. Well, as a doctor, I'm happy to hear that. So how did this happen? You don't remember? I hurt myself pretty bad when I fell for you just now. Marable chuckled. Oh, really? Then I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but it's going to hurt a whole lot more now because I'm going to have to clean that up with hydrogen peroxide. Dr. Marable soaked a few cotton balls and began wiping John's bruise. That's when he suddenly held his chest and closed his eyes shut. Marable furrowed her brows and asked him, Are you alright? It shouldn't hurt that much. No, I need an inhaler. Do you have asthma? No, it's just that. When I look at your beauty, it takes my breath away. Marable shook her head. You know how to joke, don't you? Who said I was joking? I'm really feeling a little lightheaded. I actually have a health condition. And what's that, Romeo? John slipped for a moment and let out a laugh. I suffer from the lack of vitamin U. Marable gave the last tie on the gauge. Are you sure it wasn't that you hit your head too when you got this bruise? Maybe you're right, cause I'm seeing Cupid everywhere now. You're good to go, Mr. Anderson. It wasn't that major. It will heal in two or three days, but as for the hallucinations, I'll have to recommend you to another doctor. That will be alright, I was just having some fun. Thank you, doctor. But before I go, I did have another question. Let me guess, another pickup line? No, I promise. Yes? Do I have to get critically injured for us to meet again, or can I just call you? You're funny. Please, please don't try anything dangerous. It was nice meeting you. Don't forget to pick up your prescriptions from the reception. Sure, doctor. Thank you again. Dr. Marable Richards waved goodbye to her peculiar patient and went to her office room. She worked at the BNI Hospital in Roswell, Georgia. This patient, John Anderson, was quite an entertaining person. It was a Sunday morning, and the day was going by pretty slow, just until he came in. 
Dr. Marable, someone just came in and left these beautiful flowers for you. One of the nurses came in the room with some roses. Wow, these are gorgeous. Who was it? Marable asked, searching for a card. When she spotted a heart labeled with John Anderson. Never mind. It was one of the patients. Looks like you have another admirer. Oh, how I wish I'd get flowers like that one day. The nurse laughed out, teasing her. Trust me, you'll get tired of it as soon as you realize the compliments have nothing to do with who you are, but only for the pretty face you wear. Maribel Richards was a beautiful woman, and it was often that she got praised for her good looks, though she would rather be known for her merit. Nonetheless, Maribel enjoyed her career, her life, the friends and family that appreciated her. She worked at the hospital six days out of the week, and sometimes even seven, but who was counting? She was quite disciplined with her routine and got here sharp at seven and left exactly at eight. The weather was chilly tonight when she left work. Marable always walked home since she didn't live too far. However, the long narrow road she followed through the forest was a little daunting, but she had gotten used to it. It had been nearly a year of working here. With the salary she got, instead of buying a car, she would rather save it for a house of her own. It wasn't like she was getting a raise like the other male doctors she was working beside. Life. Apart from that, just because she was a doctor didn't mean she wasn't lazy to get her daily dose of exercise. And this walk was her guilty excuse. It was about halfway to her home, down the lonely road, that she heard a car driving up. She didn't pay attention to it at first until the car slowed down beside her. She started to feel a little uncomfortable as it followed on with her. And the driver rolled down his window. Dr. Marable, I didn't know you walked down this route. Did you like the flowers? Dr. Marable passed a glance at the car, irritated by another guy who was trying to flirt with her. Just until she recognized the man she treated earlier today. John Anderson. Had he been waiting for her? They were lovely, thank you, but you didn't have to go through the trouble. It wasn't trouble, it was a gift of appreciation for my lovely doctor. Would you like a lift? He said, smiling at her. That's all right, my house is only a walk away. Come on, get in the car, I'll take you there. You look exhausted. Maribel wasn't that naive to get into a car with a random guy she barely knew, patient or not. No, thank you, I'm fine, she said as she continued walking. But to her discomfort and now anxiety, John drove his car closer to her by the sidewalk. Is everything okay? You see, I try to stay pretty honest and you don't look that great when you're worried. Where's that beautiful smile from this morning? You know, I should really get home and rest. I have work early tomorrow. That's why I wanted to drop you off. Marable scanned the street. People usually didn't take this route, except for a few cars now and then. She thought this guy was okay before, but now he was starting to become suspicious. Why was he being so pushy? I'm not trying to be rude, Mr. Anderson, but that won't be necessary. I'm getting really late. Good night, she said as she walked off. John sighed as he leaned back in his seat. All right then, doctor. Your wish. I'll see you around. He rolled up his window and drove off, waving at Marable. Marable shook her head, letting out a sigh. She reached home not long after, locked her door and went on with her nightly routine. She went about cleaning up when she noticed a car through her bedroom window, parked opposite to her house. Marable drew her curtains and looked closely, only to be frightened to see John sitting there, looking directly at her. He had followed her to her house. How long had he been stalking her like a peeping Tom? Now he even had her address? He knew where she worked? And yeah, coincidence that he knew which street she took home. She was the fool to fall for his stupid jokes. Never again. Never again. Marable anxiously waited for a while to see if he would leave. However, when it had been a long half hour, she started to get worried. 
She quickly picked up her phone to call the police as she tried to get a look at his license plate number. Just when, John caught a glimpse of her, and this time, he quickly stepped on the gas and drove off. Maribel had no doubt now that his intentions weren't right. She sat down, letting out a deep breath. Who knew what he had in mind? She had her dinner and sat down to binge watch some shows in bed. But all she could think about was that some creep was stalking her outside her window. Alas, around midnight, Maribel dozed off with a flashlight and a knife on her bedside table just in case. It was always better to be safe than sorry. Maribel woke up to a slight noise in her kitchen. What was that? Her heart started to race, seeing it was about 2 a.m. now. She immediately checked outside her window. It was quiet. The streets were empty. But the silence was soon disturbed. When Maribel picked up on one of her floorboards creak outside her room, was this really happening? Did that freak patient of hers really break into her house? Maribel took the knife in her hand and stepped outside. Her hallways were empty. She walked into her living room, empty. She peered into her kitchen, empty. But why did Maribel get this strange feeling that things weren't what they seemed? That's when Maribel noticed something to the corner of her eye. She immediately turned around, seeing a figure in the darkness. She was horrified, but she didn't wait a second to defend herself. She gripped her fist firm and, and hit the man as hard as she could, right on the face. The man screamed out in pain before he ran out the back door of the house. Maribel instantly locked her doors and windows. Her hands were now trembling. Should she call the police and tell them what happened? But she knew who it was. But what John didn't know was that he picked the wrong girl. Maribel wasn't just beauty, she was brains. She stayed at a friend's house that night and for the next few days until she returned home. She installed new locks and invested in a security system. She wasn't going to give anyone a chance to mess with her again. Fifteen years had passed since that frightening night. Maribel fortunately never fell into a situation like that again. She progressed quite a lot. She was transferred to another hospital, she pursued another medical degree, and life was going great. It was the weekends, and Maribel was finally taking a break from her busy schedule. As she checked some emails, she tuned on to the late night show. His acts were despicable, his intentions were horrendous, and just by hearing his stories, anyone would be disturbed. This man got away with taking the lives of many innocent women for more than a decade. We have Dr. Jean Aniston here today who has interviewed this serial killer and stumbled upon his bizarre views that led him to do what he did. When I sat down opposite to him, I wondered how difficult it would be to get him to discuss his horrific doings. However, I found him forthcoming in sharing his opinions on the matter, as you'll see in the footage. What was the reason behind doing this to all these women that you picked up? Did you particularly choose these women? Did a certain preference motivate you? I've always disliked women who are feminists, women who consider themselves career-oriented. The type of women that fought for social changes that, that would make them, in their words, equal to men, while retaining the advantages and privileges of being a woman. In my youth, I've interacted with many people who held this sort of mentality and I blame them for ruining my life. Things should not be this way. I see. In fact, all of your victims were indeed working women. People who know you call you by the name Scarface. Would you share with us how you got this scar? This happened many years ago, at a time I was living in Roswell, back in Georgia. Out of all the women I had targeted, no one had escaped my hands except for one. She was a doctor and I had been following her for quite some time. She lived alone. She was punctual with her schedule, so it was easy for me to keep track on her. But when I broke into her home that night, 
I don't know how she knew. It couldn't have been possible that she had seen me. But that night, it felt like she was expecting the danger. As if she knew I would come. I got the scar from her. In fact, I became blind in this eye. It was her that hit me that night. Marable suddenly froze listening to the man speak. It almost sounded like he was speaking of her, of that night. She put down everything and looked at the man on the screen, recognizing the scar across the left side of his face. All these years, Marable blamed John for this, while it was someone else all along. So John was a good guy, and that night she had fought off an actual serial killer? It was a beautiful, windy afternoon in Seattle, Washington. Not a speck of sunshine could be seen through the gloomy skies that were covered in dark, gray clouds. Meredith Moss was walking out in the garden area of her apartment complex. She wasn't really in a good mood. Life had her a bit overwhelmed at times. She walked through the park, enjoying the cool weather, pondering over her life. She was all alone in the city of Seattle. Not a lot of people were out today. Meredith watched the last of those who were out head back inside in a hurry. Suddenly, she flinched to the sound of booming thunder in the air. At once, large drops of rain started scattering over the pavement. Before she could even make a move, the whole atmosphere had become foggy in the heavy rain showers that poured from the skies. Meredith needed to get going. She grabbed her dress and ran to the apartment entrance. As soon as she got under the shade of the building, she wrenched the water out of her wet skirt. But it was really of no use. She was soaked. Meredith sighed, looking at the stairs. She lived all the way on the eighth floor. The windows to the corridor were always kept open and the stairs, they were slippery wet as well. Although this was a big issue for Meredith, no one else in the building seemed to care because there was an elevator handy at their service. Meredith didn't like using elevators, but today seemed like a day she would have to. It was raining and thundering so hard, she just wanted to get home. She took a deep breath and pressed a button. The elevator opened up in moments and Meredith stepped inside. She selected her floor and held tight to the railing. She hated the dizzy feeling she got whenever the elevator lifted off. She closed her eyes and tried to think happy thoughts. When suddenly, the elevator took a jolting shake. Meredith opened her eyes worried sick. The lights started flickering and soon enough, they went out. It was pitch dark. Meredith's heart started racing. She started to panic. Anxiously, she touched the walls, searching for the intercom. She picked it up in relief and dialed in the register number. But there was no sound. The electricity was out for good. Help! Help! I'm stuck in the elevator! Help! Meredith banged on the door, screaming at the top of her lungs. Unfortunately, her cries were going unheard. It felt like she had been screaming for hours. Her voice was failing on her. Someone open the door! Someone! Anyone! I'm trapped in here! Please, help! She sat down to the corner and weeped helplessly. Every time she heard the thunder rumble, she tried calling out again but no one was around to hear her. Is anyone inside the elevator? It sounded like the voice of a young man. Meredith jumped up immediately. Yes, yes please, I've been stuck in here for so long. Please help me out. Okay, okay, uh, can you hear me clearly? Is everything alright in there? Yes, I can hear you. Please just help me get out of here. 
Don't worry, just try to stay calm. Let me see what I can do. Maybe I can get in. I'm trying to open the door. When the electricity suddenly went out in his apartment, Sterling Walker went out to check the matter, when he suddenly heard the cry of a young woman from the elevator. He took out his pocket flashlight and held it in his mouth and tried to inch open a space between the elevator door. Once he got his hands inside, he was able to push the rest of it open. The elevator was stuck in between two floors. Sterling got down and opened the emergency exit on top of the elevator. He shone his flashlight inside and saw a young girl standing there, her cheeks wet in tears. It's raining really hard outside. Seems like there's a power outage. He held out his hand. Come on, hold my hand. I'll pull you up. Meredith was awfully scared. What if the elevator would go crashing down to the ground floor? What if he would drop her under? She didn't have the strength to pull herself up. Her eyes started tearing up again. I can't do this. You have to try. Put your feet on the railing and try to push yourself up. I can't. This is too difficult. Come on. It's not as hard as you suppose. No, I'm telling you I can't. It was hard to see as was, and Sterling was trying to give his best to get this girl out of here, but it felt like she wasn't even willing to cooperate with him. All right then, you stay here and wait for the electricity to come back, if it does anyway, and I'm leaving. Sterling put his hands up on the top floor and was about to hoist himself up when Meredith called out to him. No, no please, don't leave me here alone. Sterling stared at her. She was so scared, she started shedding tears again. Please don't go. Sterling got down again. Move out of the way. What are you doing? Sterling jumped inside, rubbing the dust off his hands. Okay, if you're not gonna get out of here, I'll stay with you till the electricity comes back. Sterling sat down in the opposite corner, fiddling with his pocket flashlight. The light had dimmed out already. He didn't know how long it was going to last like this. What's your name? Meredith Moss. I'm Sterling Walker. I live on the fifth floor. And right now, we're stuck in the middle of the fourth and the third. How often does this happen? Well, I've heard it does. That's why I don't like using the elevator. But it was raining so hard today, I got all soaked. I thought I'd get home a little faster. Oh, I was wondering why the floor was so wet. Yeah, I forgot to go to the bathroom today. Sterling shifted a little uneasily. Uh, it's okay. Happens. Meredith chuckled. Don't worry, it was my dress. They can soak up a lot of water, okay? Phew, you scared me there. I've never seen a girl cry this much before. That's cause you've never been stuck in an elevator before. Well, I'm stuck here with you now, Sterling said as he started searching his pockets. He took out a packet of peanuts. Might as well make the best of it instead of crying, right? Want some? Meredith smiled and shook her head. No, thank you. So which floor you live on? What do you do? On the 8th, I moved here a couple of months back. I'm not really a city girl. I miss home in Wyoming a lot. No skyscrapers and technical difficulties there. Just plain open fields and fresh air. Nice. I always wanted to visit the countryside. Well, I'm gonna go back home for Christmas. I can show you around if you want to tag along. Yeah, not unless we die in here today. What? Meredith said in shock. Sterling laughed out. I was joking, don't worry. Last thing I'll do before this plummets down is get you out of here first. Promise? What? You women have it real nice, huh? And what about me? The two started laughing when suddenly the lights to the elevator flickered on again. Sterling jumped up in joy stumbling back with the jolting shake of the elevator starting again. Finally, the electricity is back. Now that wasn't too bad, was it? He said jubilantly, but the elevator was eerily quiet. Sterling held the railing a bit startled to find the elevator empty. He turned around in a circle nervously. Where did the girl go? Sterling waited anxiously for the doors to open. 
as he stepped out. He held the door for a while and just stared inside. No one but him. How could this be? She was in there, with him the whole time. Not knowing or understanding what just happened, Sterling immediately went to the register. Upon seeing him, the receptionist said, Has the electricity started in your apartment? There was a power outage just a while back. Yeah, yeah, it's alright. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me which apartment Meredith Moss lives in? Meredith Moss? I'm sorry, I don't know any of the tenants under that name. Are you sure you know all of the tenants? She's young, like in her 20s, hazel eyes, brunette. She was wearing a sundress. Maybe you saw her come in. Sorry, mister. I've been here the whole day. I would have remembered a pretty girl if I saw one. There is no one named Meredith who lives in this building. Sterling was absolutely bewildered by what he experienced. He couldn't sleep that night. He needed to find that girl. How could she get out of there without him noticing? And how could the receptionist not know about her? Was he new to the job? The night went by awfully stressed. And the very next morning, Sterling went to the 8th floor and knocked on all the doors. Not only did Meredith not open up, but no one even knew her. Sterling tried speaking to the security guard, but even he didn't know who he was talking about. Despairingly, Sterling sat down on the stairs and tried remembering what exactly happened that day while he searched up Meredith Moss on his phone. What? What is this? Sterling spotted a news article on the apartment complex he lived in. Apparently, the apartment complex was actually quite old. It was built in the 1900s, but having been renovated many times over, it looked like it was in good condition. However, the machinery, electrical lines, and plumbing often had many issues and malfunctioned, like it did that day. There was a woman named Meredith Moss who lived here some years back. She had gotten trapped in the elevator during a power outage due to a horrible storm. Being trapped in there for so long, she became frightened and suffered a stroke, and by the time the management opened the doors, the woman was found lifeless. She was only 22 when she passed away. She had recently gotten a job and rented an apartment on the 8th floor, and was trying to build her future in the city. It seemed that a small accident turned things around for her. Sterling couldn't believe what he was reading. He opened up a few more articles on the incident. They all reported the same event. Meredith Moss was no more. She was buried at the Seattle Cemetery not too far from here. Sterling left all his work and headed there. He needed to see this for himself. He was overawed when he looked at the picture of Meredith Moss engraved onto the tombstone. This was her. This was the girl he was with that day in the elevator. I was hoping to meet you again. I never imagined it to be here, like this. I hope you can rest in peace, Meredith. I wish you were there that day. Click on the subscribe button and check out more When Ivan had set out on his journey from home in Tavir, the weather hadn't become so harsh. The flint gray skies foreshadowed a winter storm coming soon but Ivan had expected to reach Moscow within a few hours. However, driving through the sleet-covered roads that had slowed him down, it wasn't long before the skies turned to a lifeless white as the snow began to fall. The winds began to howl, and the flogging squalls of winter blew loudly. Every time the screeching gusts of wind came to a stop, an unsettling silence haunted the land, leaving uncertainty of what was to come next. 
Ivan halted to a stop, unable to see anything that came in front of him or behind him. How am I going to get out of here? It's a blur outside. Nothing but white swirling snow could be seen from the car windows. He was stuck in a blizzard. There was no way to drive any further. The roads were blocked with heaping piles of snow and the car wheels now spun in place. Ivan turned on the heater in his car and wiped the steam from the windows, looking out every now and then. Ivan searched his compartment and pulled out a bottle. I might sell the fake stuff, but I always keep a nice, genuine bottle for times like this. Heck, it's never not the time to have a sip. Ivan drank on, hoping it would keep him warm, till the weather cleared out. Unfortunately, hours had gone by, Ivan's fingers became sore and stiff, and the bottle now lay empty on the seat. Temperatures rapidly began to drop as the sun started to set. With no way to get out, nor any way to start a fire or eat food, Ivan began to fear the worst with the coming of the night. Puffing his hot breath onto his frozen hands, Ivan suddenly noticed light glowing out in the darkness of the night. He squinted his eyes, trying to focus. Could there be people over there? There was no point of sitting in here, waiting for a slow end. Ivan opened the car door and stepped out. The piercing winds outside were enough to discourage anyone. But Ivan pulled his legs through the snow, covering his face from the winds as he walked towards the light. After much struggle, he felt relieved when he realized the light was coming from a cabin. In hope of rescue, he knocked on the door. A beautiful young woman opened the door and stared at him. She clutched onto her sweater as the cool breeze instantly made her cheeks and nose become rosy red. I'm Ivan. I was driving through here when my car got stuck. I've been out here all day. I hadn't noticed this cabin in all the snow. But when I saw the light, I came out to search for shelter. Would it be possible for me to stay here till the weather clears out? No, you can't stay here. This isn't a motel. We're not taking in visitors. You've walked this far. If you walk a little more, you'll find something else. Go from here. Hold on. You can see the situation outside. It's not possible to walk in this weather. That's not my problem, the young woman said as she tried to close the door. Ivan suddenly heard a voice from behind her. Who is it, Larissa? There's a man here, uncle. He wants to stay. A middle-aged man came to the door. You go inside. I'll see the matter he said as the young woman hurried off. Who are you? Do you need anything? May I stay here? You can see the weather outside. I've been stuck out here all day. Sure, come in. Looks like this blizzard isn't ending anytime soon, the man said, ushering Ivan inside. Looks like you've developed some frostbite. Don't worry, I have the perfect remedy for that. I'm Dr. Baronov, and this is my niece, Larissa. We actually came here for work, but got stuck here as well. Ivan sat down on the wooden chair by the fireplace as he looked around. This was a doctor's chamber. He could barely see a table and some equipment covered by a curtain to the other half of the cabin. Larissa, could you prepare some hot towels for the man? Dr. Baranoff said as he poured a drink and brought it to Ivan. Enjoy. Nothing will warm you up like a shot of this. I'll get the hot towel. It should relieve the frostbite. Thank you, Ivan said, gulping it down all at once. As he warmed up, he could hear Larissa murmuring to her uncle behind the curtains. Uncle, we're stuck in here in this weather and now we'll have to share our provisions with this stranger? Who knows how long till the blizzard ends? Larissa, don't be unreasonable. It's only a matter of a few days. Dr. Baranov came out and sat beside Ivan. It's very considerate of you to allow me to stay. No, no. I'm a doctor. It's my duty. How could I let you go? No one would survive in this weather. Ivan quickly peered a glance at Larissa, who was sitting on a stool by the window, folding her arms. When she caught his gaze, she gave him an uninviting look and turned around. Luckily, it was night. Everyone would go off to bed soon. Dr. Baranov called Ivan to dinner. I hope you like Razolnik. Nothing beats a hot soup in the cold. Larissa, would you serve us? 
Sure, uncle. Larissa brought the pot to the table and served her uncle. She then simply pushed the pot to Ivan. The ladle is hot, she scowled before sitting down to eat herself. Upon seeing Ivan's discomfort, Dr. Baranoff went to serve him. That's all right, I'll take it myself. After dinner, Ivan got cozy by the fireplace. Ivan, we were really not prepared for this, but we're all trying to manage here. It's not much, but here's a blanket for the night. That will be all right, doctor. My jacket will be good enough. Then I'll take it, uncle. He doesn't need it, Larissa said, taking the blanket and walking off to the other side of the curtain. Don't mind her. If you need a blanket, just let me know. No, no, I'll be fine. Ivan couldn't wait for this blizzard to end. He had no wish to stay here unwelcomed. After a stressful night, he woke up to the brightest light outside the window. The cabin was filled with the smell of warm coffee. Good morning, Ivan. Come join us for breakfast. Morning, Ivan said, wiping the steam off the window to look outside. Oh, there's no way to get out of here. The snow is still pouring, and it's already stacked up a few feet high. Larissa roughly placed a bowl of gasha and coffee in front of Ivan. It's getting cold, she said before she went back to sit by the window, scribbling something into her diary. Ivan sat by the fire to eat when Larissa came up to him with a pile of wood in her arms. Can you move from here? Can't you see we have things to do? Ivan put aside his bowl. Yeah, just give me a moment. What was wrong with this girl? Why did she have to be so rude? Larissa dropped the wood into the fire and went off. Your niece is quite friendly, Ivan chuckled. Dr. Baranoff nodded. She's... She actually doesn't like having visitors. She has a hard time trusting people. You see, her parents were killed by an intruder when she was only a child. It's been traumatizing for her. Oh, I see. That's terrible. Ivan felt a little embarrassed for being judgmental. He tried to stay out of her way, but much of the day went by just sitting out watching the snow. Looks like we've survived another cold day. The night is getting dark. Come on, Larissa. It's the perfect time to share a story. I would rather sit and watch the night sky, uncle. Don't be like this, Larissa. Come here. Let us three pass the time. Ivan, have you ever heard of the Wendigo? Actually, I've met many foreigners while doing business here. It was a long time back. A man shared the legend of the Wendigo with me. A malevolent creature out in the harshness of the winter. Yes. I always wondered why there weren't such folklore here in Russia, where the winters are so harsh. They say these creatures are out to eat flesh, though they have an insatiable hunger. The legend actually roots out from the fact that men have sometimes been overpowered by greed and the will to survive, resorting to even flesh of their loved ones. It's quite haunting considering we're in a similar situation. Well, isn't it swell that we have food? Dr. Baranoff chuckled. Let us have dinner and keep our fingers crossed for tomorrow. Ivan was feeling a little better after passing some good time with Dr. Baranoff. However, Larissa was sitting there with a pout the whole time. That night, Dr. Baranoff offered to cook roasted potatoes and meat. Ivan had been starving. The cold really sucked out all the energy even without doing anything. The meat and potatoes really worked miracles in keeping him warm. And surprisingly, Ivan fell sound asleep that night. But it was some time in the middle of the night, he was disturbed by a strange noise. All of a sudden, he had trouble breathing. Ivan opened his eyes, horrified to see Dr. Baranoff pressing a cloth to his mouth. His arms and legs had been tied. Ivan tried to yell out, but it wasn't before long. Everything started to go black. Ivan woke up with a strange numbness in his body. His vision was blurry, and there was a pain in the back of his head. 
suddenly remembering the dreadful moments before he blacked out. Ivan jumped up. Where was he? He found himself sitting in a bathtub, full of snow. The cabin was silent, empty. Where was Dr. Baranov and Larissa? They had fled. Ivan tried to pull out of the snow when he suddenly felt a piercing pain to the side of his stomach. He widened his eyes, seeing a cut that had been stitched up, and a piece of paper kept on the windowsill beside him. What did these people do to him? Darn, if it wasn't for this storm, Ivan would have never stayed with them. He opened the letter. This looked like a paper from Larissa's diary. It was a letter from her. I tried to warn you again and again. I told you to leave, but you didn't listen. Now see what has happened. I did what I could to save you from this, but you didn't pay heed to my warnings. My uncle is a doctor, but he isn't loyal to his profession. He's involved in a dark business. Last night, while you were unconscious, he performed surgery on you. But don't worry, you're still safe, sound, and healthy. My uncle, I know him. I've grown up in his care. He's not that bad. You still have one kidney. You can survive on that. The blizzard has subsided, and my uncle and I have to find a new place to settle since you've found our location. I put snow in the tub to lessen the pain, and I left painkillers in your jacket pocket. If you walk 20 minutes north, you'll find a landline there. You can go and call for help. Take care, and be careful. It was the middle of autumn in the small town of Levocha in Slovakia. The weather had been gloomy for the past few days. Luckily, Miss Mary Minarovich had stocked her home with some essentials beforehand, foreshadowing a big storm to come. And sure enough, the rain started to pour since morning today. Here is the tulip poplar tonic. Tell your mother take two spoons twice every day. It will help bring down the fever and any pain. Thank you, Madam Mary. Is there anything you want me to bring you from the market? That's all right. The weather doesn't look good. Go on now. Hurry and run back home. Mary Minarovich was known for her knowledge of herbal medicines. Over the years, she had become like a village doctor to the people of her town. The people respected her and came to her not only for her remedies and cures, but Mary was also an expert midwife. And if there was one person the townspeople trusted and preferred to call to help deliver their children, it was Madame Mary. By the afternoon, the winds began to pick up. The road outside Mary's cottage was now filled with the comforting aroma of her borscht soup. When the sky started to darken, she went around her home and lit her lanterns. Sitting by her window, she enjoyed the breeze as she dipped the coarse pieces of bread into her steaming soup. Life was just as simple for her, living all alone in the small cottage. Suddenly, hearing a knock on her door in the middle of the night, Mary got out of bed, lit her lantern again, and rushed to check who had come. She was surprised to see a tall man standing under the shade of her home. Madam Mary, would you please come with me? My wife, it's her time, he said anxiously. Levocha was a small town, and Mary knew most of the people here. But she couldn't seem to recognize this man. You don't seem like you're from this town, and on a night like this, how did you get here in this horrible weather? And how can I go in this heavy rain? My name is Andre. I live in the neighboring town. I came here by my carriage. Please, Madam Mary, come with me. I really need your help. Mary looked out to see the man's carriage outside her home. It was a donkey carriage. In this mud and rain, your donkey won't be able to pull us. And if your wife is truly in labor already, by the time we reach the next town, she would have probably given birth. No, Madam Mary, the donkey will be able to take us there. We'll reach there on time. Please, I request you to come with me. Seeing the desperateness in the man's eyes, Mary agreed to go. All right, but let me take some items with me. We'll need it for the delivery. It's all right, Madam Mary. I made all the preparations at home, but the labor pain started so suddenly, I had to come get help. So Mary wore her cloak and followed the man to his carriage. She quickly climbed in and sat inside as he came to close the door behind her. I'll be driving the carriage as fast as I can. The mud and water might splash onto here. 
so please don't open the doors. But if you sit outside and drive the carriage in this rain, you'll get sick. It's all right, Madam Mary. I'll be fine. With that, the man quickly closed the door and hurried off onto his donkey. Mary sat in the back, listening to the rain pour heavily above her as the carriage pulled off. It was probably going to take a long time to get to the next town. But a few minutes into sitting, Mary was a little surprised how smooth the carriage was running. She had expected the ride to be rather difficult, getting stuck in the slippery roads here. She pushed open the door just a little and peered outside. It was dark. The carriage was traveling quite fast, but strange as it was, Mary couldn't feel it shake. It was oddly still. She closed the doors again and sat there patiently. When suddenly, the carriage halted and Andre opened the door. We're here. Here? Wow, we got here to the next village so fast. Mary got down staring at a small wooden cottage just a distance away. She looked at the donkey bewildered. It wasn't even tired. But what was more strange was that there was no mud on its legs. Yet they rode here so fast in this weather. Andre tied his donkey to the fence and led Mary inside. Mary was surprised when she walked into a near empty house. All there was was a bed upon which lay a young woman clutching onto her blankets in pain. Mary hurried to assist her. What is your name? Katerina. Don't worry, Katerina. Everything will be fine. Can you tell me how long has it been since the labor started? It's been a few hours, and the pain is getting worse. Feeling the young woman's stomach, Mary nodded with a smile. It seems that the baby will be here soon. Mary peered around the empty room before she called Andre. I'll need a clean cotton cloth. Yes, Madam Mary, I'll bring it right away, Andre said before he rushed to one of the rooms. Mary was startled when he came back in only seconds and handed her the cloth. Where is your stove? We'll have to start a fire and boil some water. Hurry, there's not much time. Mary sat beside Katerina, trying to console her as she waited for the boiled water. You're in pain. Don't worry, it will be fine. It's only a matter of time and patience. I can see your husband cares a lot for you, but he's a bit impatient, isn't he? He worries a lot for me. It was just minutes before Andre walked in carrying the pot of boiling water with his bare hands. Mary jumped up to help him. What are you doing? You'll burn yourself. She said, quickly taking hold of the pot with a cloth. It's all right, Madam Mary. I'll be fine. Andre said, simply letting go, unharmed. Mary didn't waste any time to place the cotton cloth into the water to purify it when Katerina suddenly cried out in pain. It's time. It's time. It's a baby boy. Mary quickly wrapped the newborn in a dry, clean piece of cloth and placed him in his mother's arms. Concerned for Katerina, she quickly inquired. Are you all right? Katerina looked at her in gratitude. I love him. I can't live without him. Mary smiled as she watched the couple admire their child. A moment they'd cherish forever. That night, she helped Katerina clean up and showed her a few tips to take care of the child. She gave Andre a list of some foods and herbs that would help the mother and child heal over the days, before she prepared herself to get home. The night isn't over. Why don't you drop me home? Of course, Madam Mary. Andre brought out a pouch and offered it to her. You don't know how much joy you've brought into our lives today. I don't know how to thank you. No, I can't take this. Just getting to see your beautiful child was rewarding enough. And I don't have to tell you to take care of your wife. You're already doing such a good job. Andre timidly chuckled. I love her more than anything. I know, she also loves you more than anything in this world. Madam Mary, please, name our child. Mary chuckled, looking at the baby nestled in blankets in his mother's arms. Adam. There was only a few hours to dawn when Mary got onto the carriage. Andre returned her home in just a matter of minutes. She bid him farewell, watching him ride off again. 
Letting out a deep breath, Mary went inside her cottage and sat down, wondering about her strange experience tonight. He wasn't a human. Who was he? Mary had realized something wasn't right the moment the carriage had set off earlier that night. She found it odd how it was running so smooth. When she peered out the door, she was shocked to see the carriage floating an arm's length above the ground. When they reached there, she was surprised to see how Andre brought everything from the other room so fast, as if in a blink of an eye. But when he had gone to get the water, Mary had forgotten to tell him to soak the cloth in it. So she had left Katerina and went to find him, only to see something that shocked her even more. Andre didn't go to another room. There was no other room. He had gone outside and started the fire, and Andre was holding the pot above it with his bare hands. But all her questions were answered the moment Katerina had delivered the child. Mary held the baby in her arms, knowing he was no ordinary child. He was without a navel. Katerina, however, was a human, and Mary was worried for her, wondering if she was safe here with Andre. And seeing the concern on her face, Katerina also understood that Mary now knew. Are you all right? Katerina looked at her in gratitude. I love him. I can't live without him. Katerina was a beautiful young woman who lived in a cottage by the mountains with her mother and her father. Every afternoon, she would run out behind her home and sometimes go out a little far to her favorite place up in the mountain. She loved spending time there because when she would go, she would always find a special fruit left behind for her. Fruits that she had never seen before, sometimes a guava, sometimes a pomegranate or a cherimoya. Katerina, why do you go there all by yourself instead of playing like the others in the field? Because, father, every day a friend of mine leaves a gift for me there. A gift? What gift? Katerina showed her father a pitaya. He took it in his hands, bewildered. Where did your friend get this fruit? You can't find these here in Slovakia. I know, it's strange, isn't it? Every day he leaves me a gift. Fruits that look so bizarre. Nobody knows what it is in this village, but they're always so sweet. Things went on like this until one morning, Katerina returned to her favorite spot and closed her eyes, waiting for her friend to come. When she opened them, she saw yet another beautiful exotic fruit. But this time, she didn't pick it up. I want to see you. Show yourself to me, or I won't have your gift. She tried to call her friend, but he didn't respond to her, and Katerina returned home empty-handed for three days. I know you can hear me. Why don't you talk to me? But it was silent. Then I guess I'll be leaving again. If you don't show yourself to me, I don't want your gifts. And on the fourth day, when Katerina turned to leave, she froze in place, hearing a voice behind her. Katerina! She turned around, overjoyed to finally see her friend. But her friend was awfully shy. I know you're not like me. You're not like us. You bring me fruit from the land of the desert, sometimes from the land of the dragons, and sometimes from the land of spices. No human can do that. Her friend smiled at her without a word. Have you fallen in love with me? First time I saw you when you were playing here, I couldn't take my eyes off of you. You were so beautiful. Katerina chuckled, seeing him shy. He couldn't even look at her in the eyes. Then why don't you marry me? Two weeks had gone by since that strange night. Mary still hadn't been able to forget about it. It had been yet another beautiful day today. Mary went around her home, lighting her lanterns, when suddenly she heard a soft laughter outside her cottage. Barely catching a glimpse of a young boy outside, she rushed to catch him in the act. So it's you who's been stealing my fruits every day. What's your name? Where are you from? She playfully demanded to know. The young boy looked at her with a naughty smile. You know who I am. I'm from the nearby village. I'm Adam. Mary looked at the boy bewildered. It was the child. But before she could ask anything more, Adam vanished.
Liam, I'm not getting married without my Nona's blessings. We have to visit my family in Italy. All the way to Italy? Yes, we can go during the winter break. Hmm, I've never seen Italy before. And now, I'll get a chance to meet your family too. And maybe even get to find out a few secret boyfriends of yours. Oh please, you know you have secrets you don't like talking about. Like Betty, the girl you lost in a wrestling match in high school. You read my diary. Oops. After a long six-year relationship, Liam and Veronica were going to get married. Both were born and raised in the US. But Veronica had family back in Italy, and there was no way she was going to get married without visiting them, especially her grandmother. Liam too was excited about the trip, and since winter break was right around the corner, it was the perfect opportunity to travel. It was a long 14-hour journey across the globe, after which the couple landed in Turin in the morning. Veronica's family lived in San Remo, a good 5 hours journey away. But since they were so exhausted after the flight, they booked into a hotel for a few hours of rest. So how are we getting to San Remo? Are we taking a bus? No, we're gonna drive there. We'll rent a car. How are we going to rent a car without a license? Liam, I'm second generation American. I have an Italian driver's license. You're gonna love the road trip. We're gonna be driving through the mountain ranges. It'll be awesome. After a good nap, Liam and Veronica went out to have food before they would find a car rental shop. This is the best ravioli I've ever tasted, and this dressing, I hope you know how to make this. This isn't ravioli, it's angolotti. They're smaller. And what dressing? That's just olive oil, Liam. Liam was enjoying his time in Italy a lot. He was buying souvenirs, taking pictures, while Veronica was rolling up her sleeves negotiating the price for the car rental. At around 6, the couple was finally able to set off on their journey. The weather in Italy was chilly, and driving through the open roads in these small towns, as the cool breeze flew through their car windows, was refreshing. A couple hours into their journey, the mountain ranges began to pop up in sight, covered in snow behind the wispy fog in the moonlight. We're gonna have to stop here and pump some gas. There's still two hours journey left. I don't want to get stuck midway. Alright, but where's the gas station? Right there. It's not your usual gas station. There's only two pumps and the guy that's sitting there on that chair. Apart from the car headlights, there was a single lantern hung up by the window and an old man sitting outside. He squinted at Liam and then Veronica before he asked, Are you two foreigners? No, we're from San Remo. We're actually on our way home, Veronica quickly said. She didn't want anyone taking advantage of them thinking they were clueless foreigners. So late at night, San Remo is still a long way from here. Not a lot of cars come in this direction. They don't? That's strange. We were enjoying these mountains. It's so beautiful here. Liam said as he stepped out to get some fresh air. The man stared at Liam for a while. No, no. These mountains have a dark secret. This place was once known for its witchcraft. It's not safe here, especially at night. That's why people tend not to drive through here. Dark secret? What dark secret? You see, I work here at night, but I always have to be alert. Perhaps it would be wiser for you to take a stop here. There's a motel nearby. No, that will be alright. We're actually in a hurry. I only warn you because people have encountered strange things in these mountains. If you don't want to travel to the motel, you're welcome to stay here at the gas station until sunrise. It's better to be safe than sorry. Don't worry, mister. We'll be fine. We have family waiting for us. We have to get going. The man shook his head inside as he pumped in the gap. Then be careful. If you happen to see anything, don't get down from your car. It's better you hurry and cross over as soon as you can. Liam and Veronica awkwardly waited for the man to pump their gas, paid him, and quickly drove down the mountain road. Wow, people here are really superstitious, aren't they? 
Yeah, villagers believe in that kind of stuff. I grew up hearing a lot of these legends and myths about witchcraft and whatnot, but I never actually saw anything for myself. It's just folklore. Well, they have strange folklores wherever you go. Despite all the warning at the gas station, Liam and Veronica easily drove the rest of the way there. They got there around midnight, and upon hearing their voices, everyone was out of their beds, ready to greet them. Veronica's family was more than delighted to have her over, and Liam was receiving a lot of attention and hospitality. Nona, I've had enough. I can't eat anymore. What is it, Veronica? You don't like Nona's cooking anymore? I made this focaccia with my own hands. Don't tell me you like eating peanut butter and jelly. Oh no, Nona, I can eat this all day. This is the best Italian food I've ever had. Learn something from the boy, Veronica. He has better taste than you, you silly girl. Nona, you have to tell me what's in this. I've never tasted lasagna so good. Hmm, now you've recognized the real taste of Italy. This is real Parmigiano Reggiano. It was made on our farm. This batch is aged almost four years old. Over the next two weeks, Veronica's aunts, uncles, and cousins came over to meet Liam. Nona showed him around their acres of farmland, and Veronica took him around San Remo. They spent a lot of time by the beach trying out the best seafood restaurants, but nothing quite beat the shrimp risotto and bacala Nona made at home. Come the end of winter break, it was time for Veronica and Liam to head back. They had to catch their flight at dawn, back in Turin. So the night before, at around 9pm, they decided to head out. Bye everyone! Can't you two head out in the morning? It's not good to travel out here at night. No, now we have to catch our flight. It takes hours to reach Turin. Veronica, don't be stubborn. You know about the dangers. It's not safe. No, now don't worry. Have you forgotten we arrived here safe and sound around midnight when we came? It's only nine now. Everything will be fine. Wait, let me give you something. Take this. It will protect you from evil. Nona put a beaded rosary in Veronica's hand. Oh, Nona, not again. I have like a dozen of these you sent me. But you don't keep it with you, do you? All right, all right. I'll keep it with me. Happy? Take care, and call me when you get there. So Liam and Veronica started their journey back to Turin. The weeks in Italy were amazing and Liam was actually upset to go back to America. The couple drove through the hills, enjoying the beauty of the mountains this one last time. The moon was shining bright tonight and Liam and Veronica could see everything. As Veronica drove down the curving roads, Liam spotted a beautiful spot viewing out over the entire area. Come on, let's stop for a while. We're not gonna get another chance like this. All right. Veronica stopped the car at the top of the hill. The view was amazing. The thrill of taking a peek down into the forest was breathtaking. Veronica clutched onto her sweater as a strong gust of wind blew through her hair. Liam hurried to the car to get his camera. He started filming Veronica in the moonlight. Hey there everyone, it's Veronica. And Liam here. We're in Italy right now. The trip has been absolutely amazing. I wish we could stay here longer. Isn't the view just mesmerizing? These are the valleys of Liguria. Liam took a 360 view of the mountains and hills. He then put the camera down and the two sat down to enjoy the sight. When suddenly, Liam saw something in the distance. Whoa, Veronica, look over there. Is that a wolf? Where? On top of the hill. Hold on, let me zoom in on that. Liam quickly took his camera, trying to get a good picture of the wolf.
Veronica, what was that? Just when Liam went to take the picture, the wolf stood up on its hind legs and ran down the opposite side of the hill. Veronica and Liam frantically turned, scanning the forest around them. They couldn't see anything, but both of them felt like there was a presence around them, watching over them. The, the legends, they were true. Growing up, Veronica had heard many stories from her grandmother. Stories that now didn't seem like just mere stories. Nona, tell me another scary story. Your ones are the best. All right, sit down, and let me warn you, this isn't just a silly folktale. Pay heed to it. A long, long time ago, there was a small town in the mountains. The valleys of Liguria are abundant with provisions. The olive groves, the vineyards, the animals. The people never expected the coming of a harsh famine. All their crops failed overnight, their cows became milkless, their livestock perished without cause. Everything came so sudden, it raised suspicion among the people. However, it wasn't until some men caught a few women sneaking out of their homes in the middle of the night that they discovered the real cause behind the chaos. Those women were witches. They used to gather at night to conjure against the villagers. When the word spread, those women were all brought out and banished from their homes, expelled from the society. The trials lasted for two years, and around 30 women were alleged. Their properties were seized, and their families were left homeless. They didn't have a choice but to leave. But before they did, they cursed the men of the town that had accused them. You are no men. You all are wolves. They say those women seek shelter in the mountains, but as for the townsmen, no one knows what happened to them. But legend has it that they turned into wolves, now serving the witches as guardians of the hills of Ligoria. All right, men, you all performed very well today. Keep up the good work. Five more days till we're on the road again. Come on now, Loretta, it's time to wrap up. Let's get back to our tent. After a wonderful show, Gerald Speltzer and his circus team packed up for the night. People from around the city came to see Gerald's magic show at the Texas State Fair Carnival. Business was great. Father, today's show was just spectacular. Everyone was clapping when I went on stage with you. I'm going to be a star. Sure, sweetheart. You're growing up to be just like your mother. Mr. Speltzer! Mr. Speltzer! Gerald sent his daughter inside as he turned to see a young boy come out from behind the stalls. Mr. Speltzer, I'm a really big fan of yours. I've collected all your posters. I know every trick you've ever shown. Suddenly, Gerald noticed a few guards walking around. Where did that kid go? Gerald chuckled. Thank you, lad. I hope you enjoyed the show. Well, the guards here are like hawks, but I managed to sneak a peek. Gerald raised his brow asking, Where are your parents? I... I don't have any parents. I've come here to join your team. Please, please, Mr. Speltzar. I want to be a magician just like you. You don't have any other family? How did you get here? The boy shook his head now. I've been saving every penny to buy a ticket to this carnival ever since I saw your poster, and I've spent every bit of it for a chance to meet you. Please, Mr. Speltzer, don't send me away. I promise you, you won't be disappointed with me. The boy stepped back and began to perform a magic trick. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you're all about to be amazed by one of the greatest illusions of all times. I call it the vanishing. Gerald chuckled as the boy mimicked his every move. With a swift play of hands, the boy yelled, Alakazam! And at once, a sudden thick cloud of smoke filled the air. And when it had cleared out, 
the boy was gone. Gerald clapped as he scanned the area looking for the boy, when suddenly he heard a cough behind him. Ta-da! Well done, young man. You've impressed me. So will you teach me then, Mr. Speltzer? Gerald held the boy by the shoulder. What's your name? Harvey Hansen. Okay, Harvey Hansen. You can be my apprentice. Thank you. Thank you all for coming to my show tonight. Mr. Harvey, you're such a great magician. Where did you learn all these amazing illusions? He must have had a very good teacher. Harvey cleared his throat and said, I've figured my own ways over the years. But people around here know you as the student of the great magician Gerald Speltzer. Hmm, I was with him for a while, but I ask all of you here today, has Gerald Speltzer ever shown you the kind of tricks I've shown you? Harvey paced on the stage. No, how much can an old man teach you? I've reached the success through my own hard work. A certain sense of achievement sent peace to Gerald's heart when he got news of Harvey's success. He had retired after his business had suffered a great loss. He is now an old man, living on his own, his daughter happily married to a nice young man and Harvey doing well for himself. Gerald searched his cabinet and took out his little savings he had left. He wasn't in a place in his life anymore where he could spend freely, but after receiving news about Harvey, he couldn't help himself but to visit the boy. So Gerald traveled to the city to meet him. Excuse me, mister, where do you think you're going? You haven't recognized me? I'm Gerald Speltzer. I... I used to be a magician. Sorry, we can't let random people inside. Please, just one minute. I just want to speak to Harvey. Look, old man. Mr. Harvey isn't seeing anyone right now. Please, I request you. If you just tell him my name, he'll tell you to let me in. After much plea, the security guards inquired Harvey Hansen and returned to the gate to allow Gerald inside. Come on, old man. We don't have all day. When Gerald entered the room, he was happy to see Harvey again after so many years. However, Harvey was not too thrilled. With a scowl on his face, he turned in his chair. Oh, so it's you. Harvey, I saw the newspaper. You were on the headlines. What to you? Why are you here? How could I not come? Today you're a great magician. I'm so proud of you. Stop right there. Look, if you want some money, I can help you out. But don't say all these things that you're proud of me. What are you proud of me for? Harvey, how can you behave like this? I treated you like a son. You were with me for so many years. I taught you to be who you are today. You taught me? I've reached here on my own. Harvey took a small blade from his table. He stretched out his hand and made a long cut across his palm. What are you doing, Harvey? Stop this. Gerald was bewildered to see the cut heal in seconds right in front of his eyes. Harvey raised his brow smirking. What did you say, old man? You taught me, right? So why don't you tell me now how I did it? What are you trying to prove, Harvey? Did I not raise you like my own? Your words mean nothing to me. You're nothing anymore, Gerald Speltzer. Those days are over when people used to find your petty tricks entertaining. This is why today you're in this condition. Nobody wants to see you. I don't even want to see you. Get away from here. Harvey, I came here to speak with you. Let us sort our matters. Guards! Harvey, how can you be so ungrateful? Harvey turned around as the security guards rushed inside. It's all right, I'll leave on my own. Harvey watched Gerald go out the door. He leaned back in his seat and let out a sigh. Gerald Speltzer had taken Harvey Hansen as his apprentice when he was just 12 years old. The boy's passion for magic distinguished him from the others on the circus team. Over the years, Gerald taught his daughter and Harvey side by side as they were of similar age. And it was over these years that a certain bond developed between the two. 
Before long, both were in their teenage years. That's when Harvey began to grow feelings for this lovely young woman, Loretta. Mr. Speltzer, there's nothing I've hidden from you all these years, and I think it's time I discuss something with you. What is it, Harvey? I'm in love with your daughter, and I want to marry her. All right, young man, you can marry her, but as a father, you must understand my concerns. I don't doubt your love for her, but perhaps you should take things easy. Focus on your career. Once you're established, you can marry Loretta. Harvey struggled day and night to bring himself to a better position in his life. Loretta was a beautiful young woman. She was learned, talented, and it wasn't before long that Gerald began receiving numerous proposals asking for his daughter's hand in marriage. Loretta, it will be years before Harvey will reach anywhere. I've found for you a better suitor. The young man belongs to a respected family. He's wealthy and educated. I deem it best you accept his proposal. Yes, father, as you wish. It was on the day of the marriage that Harvey left Gerald and went off on his own. He promised himself he would reach that level of success one day. That day, Gerald would regret what he did. He would wish his daughter were now married to him. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I will show you the best of all magic tricks you will be mesmerized to see. I will need someone from the audience to assist me. Is there anyone? Harvey scanned the crowd as a man walked down the aisle raising his hand. I would like to assist you. Very well then, come on up. The man walked onto the stage looking at Harvey. Mister, what is your name? Call me your Famulus. All right, trusty Famulus. What do you say we show all these lovely people here today how to fly? As you wish, great magician. Harvey walked towards the crowd raising his hands. I grew up as a lonely child. Everyone around me used to point to the stars and tell me, your parents are watching over you. At the time, I didn't understand them. All I wanted to do was fly up to the heavens myself. They say a child's imagination is greater than the world. Perhaps it's really true. Harvey chuckled as he began to raise himself into the air. Fabulous, take this hoop and hold it steady. I will show you all that this is nothing but sheer magic. The crowd started gasping and murmuring. How is he doing it? Nothing is holding him up. He passed right through the hoop. Everyone was on the edge of their seats, watching Harvey fly through the hoop in the man's hand. Famulus, do you see any deception in this? Absolutely not. You're a great magician indeed. Harvey laughed as he suddenly raised higher and higher, soaring through the air. As the crowd cheered on, applauding him and shouting his name. Thank you. But suddenly, something didn't feel right. Harvey felt like he was losing balance. He tried to keep calm and pull off the act, but it seemed like it was too late. Plummeting down, Harvey yelled as he fell to his end, screaming out in pain on the ground. The crowd started to panic as Harvey stretched his hand to the man standing in front of him. That's when he was thunder to realize this man was none other than his teacher, Gerald Speltzer. What? Harvey had seen that man with his own eyes. Harvey had spoken to him. What kind of magic is this? This is bewitchment. How could Harvey not have recognized him? Gerald, how couldn't I recognize you? Your voice, your face. How did you do this? Harvey, I have taught you many things, but I haven't taught you everything. How? How did you do this to me? Harvey cried as his death neared him. Crew members and security guards all rushed to the stage, but before anyone could get hold of the man, he vanished in thin air. Zane and his girlfriend, Elsa, were chilling in his dorm room on a quiet Saturday morning. There was absolutely nothing to do, but the two were happy to be bored together. 
Zayn had been rolling in bed watching Elsa tune her guitar while he tried his best to irritate her by throwing small origami birds at her head. Stop it, Zayn, I'm trying to tune the guitar. Play me something. Really? I can't play anything unless I fix the strings. And what is this? A bird? Or an origami rock? I've been trying for a while now. That's as good as it's getting. Okay, done. Elsa said as she started playing Zane's favorite song again. What perfect timing. Hold on, I'm coming. Zane opened the door to Brock, one of his close friends. What took you so long? Why weren't you responding to my calls? Brock said as he came inside and plopped down on the beanbag chair. Oh, you, that's why. Yeah, me. What's that supposed to mean? So what are you musicians up to? Nothing much. What's up with you? You don't have any other plans tonight, right? We're heading down to Keeley Point Park. Oh, you got the location set? All right, man. Consider me ready. Where are you guys going? Brock and I made plans to go fishing. At night. The spot is right at the center of the nature preserve here. The area is vast. Lakes, swamps, one right after the other. But the point we're going to is perfect for fishing. The Willamette flows into the Columbia River, which flows into the Pacific up ahead. And at night, tons of fish travel downstream there. Even ones you've never heard of. Fish that you can only catch at night. We're gonna need a high-powered flashlight to see through the water in the dark. Yeah, don't worry, I got the equipment ready. There's already a designated spot for fishermen, but we aren't going there. We're taking a detour. We'll take a canoe from the reservation and travel downstream towards the Columbia River. Wow, sounds cool. Can I go too? I want to see some strange looking fish. Brock laughed out. You, please. We don't have the energy to be your bodyguard all night. What? I can take care of myself, Brock. Yeah, right. That's what all you girls say. Why don't you just go home and play with your snowman, Elsa? No way, I'm going with you guys and that's final. Elsa, you're not gonna find it fun, it's a guy thing, and it kinda gets cold there at night. I don't want to hear it, Zane, you're taking me. Zane, you don't even know how to talk to her, you just gave her another excuse. It's like I know her better than you. Elsa, the cold never bothered her anyway. Brock, enough of the Disney jokes. Just let it go, Elsa, let it go. Be the good girl you always have to be. Elsa pushed over the beanbag chair Brock was sitting in, and after much fussing over the matter, the boys finally agreed to take Elsa along. At around 8, the three caught an Uber and went to the Keeley Point Park. As Elsa started going through the fishing gear, Brock and Zane went to rent a canoe from the reservation authorities. They came back to dock on the canoe to find Elsa ready, 100%. You look nice, Zane chuckled. She looks like a freak. Dude, it's night. Why would you need to wear a hat? Shut up, Brock. I looked up all of the rules of fishing. I even brought a lantern to attract the tiny critters, phototropes, in the water, which will attract the small minnows, which in turn will attract the bigger fish. I got it all planned out. Brock shook his head. This is going to be one long night. The friends took all their equipment onto the canoe and finally headed down the riverside. They stopped by an opening by the bank. They all threw their fishing lines into the water and sat down on the moist rocks and boulders, silently waiting as they occasionally threw chunks of bait across the river. However, the clock ticked by and the night was utterly motionless. Brock and Zane were getting a little impatient and a little annoyed by Elsa's non-stop expert fishing tips and tricks she'd memorized. The predator fish don't really see well at night, so the smaller panfish will probably show up any time now. These waters have numerous fish, from bluegills, rock bass, rear deer sunfish, crappies… Alright, alright, Elsa. We get it, babe. I think we should turn off that lantern, maybe? But it's gonna attract the fish. It's only attracting insects, Elsa. Turn the thing off, sheesh. That's no problem, I have insect repellent on me. After waiting another hour and pulling up the reel to find two tiny bait-sized fish hanging to their hooks, 
Brock had just about enough of fishing. Hey man, you wanna call it a night? Without even catching a single fish? How about we go to the other side of the river? We might find a better spot there. That side is all jungles and forest. Probably gonna have more insects there, maybe snakes too. Scared, Elsa? The three friends packed the canoe again and traveled to the other side of the river. As they approached the bank, they noticed shadows of other people popping up into sight. Some of them stood up to see the friends trudging the canoe onto the muddy grounds. But they weren't probably able to see them. The hovering jungle trees made it so dark, everyone could barely make out each other's silhouettes. I think we were at the wrong place the whole time. Seems like there are a lot of other people here. Hmm, hope we find some luck. The friends stopped a distance away from the crowds and threw in their baited hooks. To their surprise, minutes into waiting, there was a strong tug on the line on all three fishing rods. The friends hurried to pull in their catch, and in only half an hour, they were able to bucket two yellow perch, three catfish, and Elsa even managed to pull in an arm's length bass. Huh, and you guys didn't want to bring me along. Uh, what are you talking about? We only agreed because... Zane, you didn't tell her? Because what? Zane looked at Brock, utterly confused, but played along to his gestures. Brock, it's better we don't tell her. What? Tell me! Look, we needed someone to gut, clean, and cook the fish after we caught it. That's why we brought you. You think you're smart, huh, Brock? I was actually going to do it, but now you two jerks can cook it all on your own. Elsa said, walking back to their bags, when suddenly she slipped and fell into the mud and the muck. Brock burst out laughing as Zane held in his laughter and helped Elsa up. However, Elsa wasn't quick to combat Brock. She scurried to check the bags. Shoot, the matches, the lantern, everything's soaked. How are we gonna start a fire? Great, so much for all the trouble catching the fish. Wait, it's not a big deal. Maybe those people have an extra box of matches. Let's go ask them, Zane said, looking into the distance. Since not a lot of people were around the area they were in, the friends left their things and walked down the bank. Brock paced faster, shaking his head at Zane and Elsa giggling with each other. It was hard to see in the dark. Brock could only spot dark shadows of men sitting up ahead. As he neared them, he searched his pocket for his flashlight. The men were all huddled together, hunched down on the ground. Brock started to hear a strange, wet, slushing noise. What was that? What were those people doing? He turned on his flashlight and called out again. Excuse? Only to be so horrified by what he saw, the flashlight dropped from his hands. They were no men. They were something else. Hunched down into groups, feasting on raw fish. Seeing Brock, they all stood up. The darkness of the night was suddenly brightened by their red, flashing eyes staring directly at the three friends. Brock turned to flee. Run! They're after us! Elsa and Zane flew into a panic seeing Brock's state. Just when they noticed, they were surrounded by these otherworldly dark figures. The friends ran down the bank into the forest. What are those things? I don't know, but they're not human. Zane turned to look back when he saw the figure chasing them. Suddenly vanish. Disperse into the air like smoke. Where did they go? Just when the friends froze, frantically looking to and fro scanning the area, numerous figures suddenly came into sight just a distance away from them. Petrified, they scrambled into the trees. They're all over the place. 
They're like some shapeshifters. We can't trust anything we see anymore. They're not going to spare us. The three friends ran in all directions and soon lost sight of each other. They screamed to signal help, but their cries only echoed into the empty jungles infested with these uncanny, otherworldly beings. Good morning, residents of Portland, Oregon. The wildlife preserve by Columbia Rivers has been closed this weekend by the police due to strange discoveries early this morning. Three individuals were found stranded in one of the luscious jungle islands across the vast wetlands. Among three students, Brock Reed was the only one to have survived, while two other students, Zane Malone and Elsa Olden, were found lifeless in a horrible condition. The student is currently being treated in an ICU where police have flooded the hospital to find answers of what had happened. Doctors, however, are not allowing any police to speak with the patient due to a serious health condition. It took their lives. There's something there. They trapped us. Those hideous black figures. Their eyes burnt like fire. It was here, and then it was there. They weren't human. You have to believe me. The patient had been hysterically screaming unusual things for hours on end. It seems if no progress can be made, the student might have to be transferred to another mental health facility. What a tragic and horrifying discovery indeed. Leaves us all in question what these innocent students had gone through in the wetlands we deem a place of peace and serenity here in Portland. BII News, Oregon. It happened not too far from here. Strange. Click on the subscribe button and check out more awesome videos on our channel. And don't forget to press the bell icon because you know it's interesting.